Good morning, and welcome to the Committee on Women and Gender Equity jointly with the Committee on Youth Services. At this time, with all panelists, please turn on your videos. I repeat, at this time, with all panelists, please turn on your videos. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Good morning. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today on this very important issue, the status of the Learning Labs program and the child and child care in New York City. My name is Debbie Rose and I'm the chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Youth Services. Today, the Committee on Youth Services is joined by the Committee on Women and Gender Equity and my friend and colleague, Chair Helen Rosenthal. We will conduct an oversight hearing on the Department of Youth and Community Development's Learning Labs programs, identifying current issues and potential responses to them, as well as the successes and ways to amplify them. But first, I'd like to recognize that we've been joined by council members, Lewis, Council Member Eugene, Council Member Kalos, Council Member Ayala, and um, we will be joined by Council Member Holden. But even before the COVID outbreak forced New York City public schools to transition to remote learning for at least some of the time, childcare, especially affordable childcare, was a serious issue for working parents. It is, apparent, it is a problem that disproportionately plagues working mothers and even more so single parents. It is an obstacle to women's full participation in the economy and society. It eats up a significant portion of a family's income, exacerbating daily survival struggles for the most vulnerable New York City families, producing constant anxiety and many sleepless nights. With the COVID outbreak forcing New York City children to spend increasingly more time learning remotely, working parents are now facing the necessity of finding not only after school care, but child care for remote instruction days as well, making already stressful circumstances even more challenging. I know just how difficult the situation is. Not, on, not only am I the chair of the Committee on Youth Services, but I'm a grandma um, with two grandchildren whose parents are both essential workers. And while my grandchildren, some think they might be lucky that I'm their grandmother and I get to mind them, there are other parents that, uh, while their parents are working, not all New York City households are equally as fortunate. And since I've, I'm also working remotely while caring for my grandchildren, I can tell you that I truly understand parents' frustration and the challenges around remote learning. It is a tough situation all around. In a more unprecedented, and in a move unprecedented since World War II, when the nation mobilized to provide free child care under the 1943 Lanham Act to support women's labor force participation as part of the war effort, our state and city recognized child care as an essential public service in an effort to cope with the COVID outbreak by first establishing regional enrichment centers and emergency childcare centers for children of essential workers, and later launched the DYCD's Learning Labs program to provide care and enrichment for children in grades K through eight on remote learning days. Given that the Learning Labs were launched in record time and during a national crisis 
it is only expected that there would be issues and challenges surrounding this program. We are here today to examine the rollout of the program, the, the problems that have arisen, the responses to them, and the encouraging success that they have had. We are here today to hear the concerns of parents, providers, and advocates, and to work collaboratively on addressing the issues and concerns to ensure that our children's education and social emotional needs are being met and that our parents are assisted in their roles as caregivers and workers and are able to, to participate in the workforce. I wanna thank Chair Rosenthal and the Committee on Women and Gender Equity for joining our hearing today, as well as the staff behind the scenes who are making sure that this online hearing runs smoothly. I'd like to thank the Youth Committee staff for their work on this issue. I'd like to thank Committee Council Paul Senegal, who unfortunately um, is leaving the council. Um, he will really be missed. Um, he has served this committee and others um, well. Committee Policy Analyst Anastasia Zeminia, Finance Analyst Michelle Peregrine, and Elizabeth Otts from the, the um, the speaker's office, sorry, Elizabeth. And I wanna give a big thank you to my staff as well. Chief of Staff, Christine Johnson, and my legislative director, Issa Cortez, and Venori Ranawari. And with that, I will now turn to my co-chair for remarks, uh, Chair Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair Rose. I'm Council Member Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. My pronouns are she and her. I want to start by thanking Chair Rose of the Committee on Youth Services for holding this hearing with us and with her very um, informed and informative opening statement. I also want to congratulate her on making the cover of city and state this week she is a powerful representative of Staten Island. We already know that child care is a gendered issue that disproportionately affects women. As the New York Times put it in September, the loss of child care during the pandemic has limited many working mothers hours. And when parents decide that one of them should give up their job, it is usually the lower paid one, most often the mother. Single parents who are usually women are even more impacted by the loss of childcare. This is why so many were hopeful that the mayor's announcement of 100,000 Learning Lab, which is K through eight, and Learning Bridges, three and four year olds, seats would allow them to keep their jobs. As people went back to work, their children would be well taken care of. So today we're here to discuss the pandemic, uh, the city's pandemic child care initiative with a focus on the K through eight learning lab program administered by the DYCD. There have been hurdles opening the learning lab bridges seats and we want to understand why. When Mayor de Blasio unveiled his plan to provide certain working families childcare, irrespective of a family's ability to pay, he promised 100,000 slots. As of last month, we are only a fifth of the way there. The one Learning Bridges site in my district with 30 seats is completely full. There is also only one learning lab site. I recently spoke with a leading child care provider in my district about why they did not respond to the city's request to provide services. They advised that they had, quote, concerns related to space, the lack of clear programmatic definition, and limitations associated with staffing up a full program for an unspecified period of time, unquote. 
I've also heard from parents that the Learning Bridge site they were given after they applied was too far away from their home to be useful. So they did not take their given um, site. The council understands that the unprecedented challenges we are facing in this pandemic, um, the count, sorry, the council understands the unprecedented challenges we are facing in this pandemic, but we are now several months into the school year. The city's much heralded plan to switch from the rec centers to learning labs so parents could continue to go to work and their children would be well taken care of has not come to fruition. We need to prioritize our children, their families, and the providers that allow our city to keep working. It's important to note that D75 students face huge hurdles in accessing the Learning Lab slash Bridges program, which DOE and DYCD have not addressed. I'm going to read parts of the statement we received from advocates for D75 students, which speaks volumes. It's a few paragraphs, so bear with me. Quote, although the DOE's website states that students with disabilities are one of the priority groups for learning labs and states that students of D75 schools may attend learning labs, the city has not created any process for approving requests for accommodations or sports or supports for students with disabilities at learning lab programs. While programs and parents have asked DYCD or the individual learning lab programs for support, both DYCD and DOE have not provided support. And as a result, programs have told parents that their children with disabilities cannot attend. For example, we are aware of students whose IEPs require them to have one-on-one -on -one paraprofessionals to provide support during, um, during learning. IEP stands for Individual Education Plans. So this is the plan that the city agrees that that child needs, sorry. However, the DOE says that due to a union issue, they cannot send paraprofessionals to DYCD contracted learning lab sites. And DYCD says they don't have funding outside the DOE to pay for paraprofessionals. Thus, students are not getting their IEP mandated supports that, and are not able to attend learning lab programs, end quote. We have heard from parents who were able to get supports for their students at the RECs in the summer and spring, but now cannot get support at the learning labs. We understand that the blame is not on DYCD or DOE, and we are here today to help we want to understand what we need to do so students, especially those with disabilities and their families and the providers are getting the support they need to participate in this program. You know, we've invited many providers and parents to testify at this hearing. However, given that they're so thinly stretched, many could not take the time to join us today. We invite them to submit their stories and insights to testimony at council.nyc.gov before Saturday. Your testimony is invaluable as we navigate a path toward the best interests of our children. Finally, I'd like to thank my staff, my chief of staff, Cindy Cardinal, my legislative director, Madhuri Shukla, as well as community staff, for their work in preparing for this hearing. Brenda McKinney, my counsel, Chloe Rivera, senior legislative policy analyst, Monica Peppel, finance, financial analyst, and Elizabeth Arts also from community engagement. And um, I'm not sure there are any additional, yeah, I want to acknowledge the council members, 
uh, the additional council members who are present, Council Member Lander. I will now send it back to Chair Rose to introduce the moderator. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Rosenthal, um, for your very thorough um, summary of what brings us to this hearing today. Um, I will now turn it over to our committee um, Legislative Council, Brenda McKinney, who will review some procedural items relating to today's hearing. Thank you so much, Chair Rose. Um, so my name is Brenda McKinney and I'm the Legislative Council for the Committee on Women and Gender Equity at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and I will be calling on people to testify. Before we begin, um, as Chair Rose mentioned, we'll be going over some housekeeping items. I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. And after you are called upon, you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce who the next panelists will be. Council member questions will be limited to five minutes. Council members, please note that this includes both your questions and the witness answers. Today, we will also allow a second round of questions at today's hearing. These questions will be limited to two minutes, again, including both your question and the witness's answer. For public testimony, I will be calling on people in panels. Council members who have questions for particular panelists should use the raise hand function in Zoom. You'll be called on after everyone on the panel has completed their testimony. We anticipate that there will be three people on each panel. For public panelists, once I call on your name, a number of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. All public testimony and this timer will be set at three minutes and be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony so that we can start the clock. So with that, we will now move to administration testimony and I will call on the following members of the administration to testify. I will say all of your names first and then we will administer the oath. So now we will call on Susan Haskell, Deputy Commissioner of Youth Services at DYCD, Daryl Ratway, uh, Ratray, excuse me, Associate Commissioner for Youth Services at DYCD, Wanda Asherl, and please um, excuse any pronunciation errors, Assistant Commissioner uh, for Community Centers at DYCD, Tracy Calderon, Assistant Commissioner of Compass at DYCD, Jagdeen Fanor, Chief Financial Officer at DYCD, Navita Bailey, Deputy Chief Financial Officer at DYCD, Josh Wallach, Deputy Chancellor at DOE at the Department of Education, Chris Tricicero, again, please excuse any mispronunciation, Senior Executive Director of the Office of Food and Nutrition Services at DOE, and with that, I will deliver the oath to all eight of you at once. So after reading the oath, I will call on each of you by name, if you can please respond to the oath one at a time. So if each of you in your camera can please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions today? Deputy Commissioner Susan Haskell. I do. Associate Commissioner Daryl Ratray. Daryl Ratray. Thank you. Sorry, we just, we might have a mute issue. Sorry, could you just for the record um, so that we can get it on the record. Uh, Daryl Ratray, can you please respond to the oath? Unmute. Yeah, if the if the host can please unmute Associate Commissioner Ratray. We'll keep going, apologies. Assistant Commissioner Wanda Ash Ashrell. I do. Testing. Yeah. Testing, can you hear me now? Yes, Testing. please go ahead. Oh, awesome. Hey, the tech problem would be me, right? I do, I do. Thank you, Associate Commissioner Ratray. 
Uh, Assistant Commissioner Tracy Cauldron. Assistant Commissioner Cauldron. I do. Thank you so much. Chief Financial Officer Jadine Fenor. Jadine Fenor. We'll come back. Deputy, Com Deputy Chief Financial Officer. I do, Jadine Fenor, I do. Thank you so much. And there is a delay, apologies. So um, it might be an unmute or technical issue. So thank you for your patience. Uh, Deputy F Chief Financial Officer, Navita Bailey. I do. Thank you so much. Deputy Chancellor, Josh Wallach. I do. Thank you so much. And finally, Senior Executive Director, Chris Tricicero, sorry, Tricicarico. Senior Dr Executive Director from DOE, Chris Tri, Tri, I'm sorry if you can say your name, Tricicarico. Sir, you should be unmuted. Can you please respond to the oath? We can keep going and swear him in um, if he responds to questions. Thank you so much for your patience. Now I do. We can. Thank you so much. He's Thank you. By the way, can you repeat that again, please? Tricarico. Tricarico, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thank you. And Deputy Commissioner Haskell, if you're ready, um, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Rose, Chair Rosenthal, and members of the Youth Services and Women and Gender Equity Committees. I'm Susan Haskell, Deputy Commissioner for Youth Services from the Department of Youth and Community Development I'm joined by my DYCD colleagues, Chief Financial Officer Jadine Fenor, Associate Commissioner Daryl Rattray, Assistant Commissioner Wanda Asherl, Assistant Commissioner Tracy Cauldron, and Deputy Chief Financial Officer Navita Bailey. From the New York City Department of Education, I'm joined by Deputy Chancellor Josh Wallach and Trish Chicorico. Chris Chicorico, I messed up Chris, not Chicorico. I'm sorry, Chris. Um, Senior Executive Director of the Office of Food and Nutrition Services. On behalf of Commissioner Chong and Chancellor Carranza, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to discuss Learning Bridges. As you know, Learning Bridges is a new program that provides free childcare options for children from 3K through eighth grade on days when they're scheduled for remote learning. Since Mayor de Blasio announced this new initiative in the summer, DYCD, DOE, DDC, MOX, and especially New York City's network of community-based providers have been working at a record pace to recreate this important childcare option. Learning Bridges programs will remain open if in-person schooling is suspended either citywide or on a neighborhood level. We appreciate that both committees sponsoring this hearing recognize Learning Bridges critical role in the city's response to the COVID-19 epidemic pandemic, helping young people stay on track academically and socially and assisting working parents. While we work to expand the number of available slots, current priority for placement is given to families in temporary housing, including shelters and hotels, children of New York City DOE school and program staff, including staff of the Learning Bridges sites and other contracted early childhood providers, families residing in NYCHA developments, children and family foster care or receiving other child welfare services, students with disabilities, children whose parents or guardian is an essential worker or who were previously enrolled in a regional enrichment center. We continue to open new programs in all five boroughs, providing a safe, a free and safe location to support remote learning and enrichment activities for DOE students on the days when they are not in school. We added seats throughout the fall and we will make offers to more families. Interested parents of eligible students can apply at the DOE website, schools.nyc.gov slash learning bridges. 
Before launching this service, DUICD and DOE reached out to the existing provider networks to discuss expanding capacity. And in order to reach additional organizations, MOX released a request for information in July. Along with our partners, we've been reviewing, inspecting, and funding dozens of new Learning Bridges groups. The base price per participant for the 2020-2021 school year is $7,812 for DYCD funded learning labs, K to eight programs. The date to respond to that RFI for providers has been extended to December 5th, and we encourage them to continue to express interest in operating a program. We welcome the council's support in that effort. There are currently 406 Learning Bridges programs operating for early childhood and K-8, to including 266 Learning Lab programs specifically for grades K-8. to Excuse me, there were 406 for um, early childhood through eighth grade. That number will continue to increase. As of today, the city has received nearly 46,000 applications to the centralized DOE Learning Bridges website from eligible students, including 28,490 from families who are identified in a priority category. 39,000 families have been matched to a Learning Bridges site. And once matched, providers connect with families to identify their blended learning schedules and gather additional enrollment information. As we expand eligibility, we anticipate more parents opting in. We appreciate your help in sharing these resources with families in your community. Safety precautions are at the forefront of our work to protect the health and well being of the young people and staff. All programs are following guidance of the CDC, New York State, and New York City Department of Health, and DOE public, and health, public health and safety protocols. We've adopted the high five wearing masks and daily screening for children and staff, frequent hand washing, cleaning and de disinfecting program spaces and common areas physical distancing and maintaining small group size and group stability throughout the day as much as possible. In addition, the city has made nurses available to all programs for on-site visits and telehealth from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Program staff have priority for expedited testing and the city is supporting programs by providing personal protective equipment whenever possible. In cases where families are experiencing symptoms of COVID-19, parents are asked to report the symptoms of a child or family member to the Learning Bridges staff and adhere to a 14-day quarantine if necessary. Children who become ill during the day are isolated and monitored and parents are contacted for early pickup and referred for testing. Testing and reporting practices mirror those in place at DOE schools, including reporting, closure, contact tracing, and 14 day quarantine protocols for confirmed cases. Child care providers notify the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the New York State Department of Health immediately about being informed of any positive COVID-19 test result by an employee or a child at their site. Reports of symptomatic youth or staff confirmed COVID-19 cases are shared with the return to school situation room. Their health experts confirm action steps that are communicated back to the Learning Bridges programs. We're pleased that the Learning Bridges, Learning Labs programs have led to new and strengthened partnerships. For example, the Learning Lab run by UAU at the West Brighton Cornerstone on the North Shore of Staten Island has been able to cultivate a partnership with the local school PS18, which is also a beacon community center. Lines of communications have been strengthened among principals, parent coordinators, and teachers, and they share resources that ensure seamless alignment of academic support and problem solving as needed. The education coordinator at that site, an, a learning lab staff requirement, works with the school day teachers to create refresher packets, individualized for each student, structured around the unit of the youth is studying during school hours. Some learning lab programs have operated in spaces that have not previously been in use for DYCD programs, such as libraries including the St. Agnes branch on Amsterdam Avenue. The Le Learning Lab program will soon bring a new service to that site through the After School All Scars provider. Learning Labs are only possible because of a strong team effort. We appreciate the efforts of our city agency partners, including Department of Health, Fire Department, Department of Buildings, and other city agencies helping us to expedite processes to get programs operating quickly and safely. We're especially grateful 
to the city council for your advocacy and support for this initiative and for helping to connect your constituents and local community-based organizations with the program. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I will now turn it to the chairs. Chair Rose. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to thank you, um, Commissioner Haskell. Um, I, I know that this has been um, a challenge to DYCD. Um, and uh, I know that um, there are many challenges and obstacles that uh, didn't make this an easy task to, to expedite. Um, I'm I'm concerned about the um, the number of, could you just tell me the number of, the total number of applications that you've, re that you've received for, um, for the services, uh, parents who want to put their children in learning lab programs? Could you tell me that number? I think you're muted. We will we'll keep we'll attempt to keep um, the administration unmuted during question and answer as well. Okay, great. To date, we've received forty six thousand applicants from eligible students, students who are enrolled in a DOE school and opted for a blending learning experience. And um, and with that, um, what is the capacity that you have um, been able to uh, amass to? How many slots do you have available? Currently, we have capacity for about 40,000 students and we continue to increase that regularly. Week to week, we are adding more sites. And, um, and these 40,000 um, slots, they have all been matched to a site? We have matched 39,000 families currently to a learning lab site of the 46,000 eligible applicants. And so um, with, the, with them being matched to a site, have, um, what's the criteria? How do you determine what sites of families will be, be matched with? At this time, we've made, we've made a few shifts in our policy since the beginning of the program. At this time, we are matching uh, programs and sometimes giving them more than one option based on geographic proximity, assuming that that'll be the most convenient site for them. At the same time, families who may want a different location, maybe because it's close to work or it's close to a family member who's taking care of the child on the off days, we are now inviting families to indicate their um, preference for the learning lab site. And um, when they're when they're assigned to these sites, um, what is is there an appeal process? Because I've gotten numerous calls from constituents that have been assigned to sites, but um, they are are not convenient. Um, they are oftentimes on Staten Island, across uh, on the other side, which would take an, an hour or more to get to, uh, making it virtually impossible for the family to utilize that site because they wouldn't be able to get to work. So um, is there an appeal process? How? Um, yes, you... there is. And I hope that you'll be seeing fewer and fewer of those. Um, as, as I said, we're growing week to week. So we have many more sites available now than we did initially. And, and again, I hope that you'll hear um, fewer situations like that. Since we last spoke, Chair Rose, I know we've added new sites to Staten Island, but if somebody is matched to a site and they, they have a one that would be more convenient for them, we absolutely want to hear from them. They should email learningbridges at schools.nyc.gov and let us know. And we'll do our very best to find a, a, better, a better site. Um, when the mayor announced this program, um, he announced that there would be uh, slots for 100,000 young people. Um, what is your timeline for being able to um, meet that, that amount, that, that goal? Well, as I mentioned, we have capacity currently to serve about 40,000 seats. I think if we met again next week, we'd be pleased to tell you that not, that number has gone up again. 
um, we have we made a commitment to serve up to 100,000 people and we are going to continue to meet the need. I think we're, we're learning more through the application process about what you know what which families are interested where they are um, you know how to cite programs geographically where the highest demand is and um, our commitment absolutely remains to meet the demand and to that end we want to encourage we want to encourage you we want to encourage families to apply that'll be you know our best indication about uh, where to cite programs and we will keep matching families to programs moving forward. We, we're pleased that we've come, you know, we're really making tremendous progress towards the current demand that we have. Well, um, yeah, because you have, um, you've met, um, you've been able to, to seat 39,000 young people. And right now you still have um, requests for 40, you know, um, there was 49,000 requests. 46,000 um, total applications, yep. Right. Um, and what is sort of the timeline? When do you think you'll be able to accommodate those um, those additional, what is it, uh, 7,000 young people? Uh, yeah, I, I just, we, there's, you know, we are just working as fast as we possibly can. And again, I mentioned even this week, um, you know, my colleague, Daryl Rattray in particular, has been communicating with the sites, the existing sites who are, um, signing up to operate in new spaces like libraries that we mentioned or additional sites coming on th through the RFI. Um, in no way are we uh, pausing at all to bring on sites. We have our pedal to the metal to ramp up capacity as quickly as possible. Um, and so we're we're just going to keep keep our pedal to the metal, keep working with our partners. What are some of the obstacles that you've you've encountered in being able to um, to make these slots available? What you know? What are the obstacles? You know, I I wouldn't say we've experienced a tremendous amount of barriers. I mean, to begin with, we I think I mentioned in the testimony just being you know profoundly impressed by the capacity of New York City's not-for-profit community to uh, meet the needs under this pandemic, to shift uh, their, their focuses. And for DYCD, the majority of programs that came line, online initially were existing providers where DYCD has an after-school contract. And, uh, but we knew that that wouldn't get us, you know, all the way to meet the needs. So we, um, Mox launched this uh, request for information. And we've had many, many proposals. And we are working through those proposals, looking at the safety of the physical sp facility, evaluating um, that the site makes sense, that there'll be demand in that area. Um, I, I'm hard pressed to identify a, a specific barrier, to be honest. I'm not sure if my any of my colleagues want to jump in and share some of their experiences. I welcome that. But I think we've, um, you know, we've really had a tremendous amount of support for well, we um, heard, groups to come we've in. We've heard from um, some providers that they've had difficulty, especially if they had programs um, functioning within schools, that they are having difficulty um, accessing space in, in, in um, DOE um, schools and that uh, they're having problems accessing uh, their their supplies and and their records and things um, for programs that they did have in schools, like uh, their compass programs um, that are now they're not now able to have at that at those locations. Well, I want to first ask if my colleague Josh could be unmuted just to um, weigh in on this. Saw his hand go up. Um, to that question. And then I'll also invite um, Daryl Rattray to speak to some of the success, successes we've had placing programs in schools. And as we as we unmute you, Mr. Wallach, um, if other members of the administration, just so that the host knows if we should unmute you, if you could raise your hand um, in Zoom as well, if we should unmute you, we will do that. Um, thank you. Okay, I think, I, can you hear me now? 
Terrific. Okay. I, I just want to go thank, first of all, thank you all for, for having us and for giving us the opportunity to update you on progress. And uh, just on behalf of the Department of Education, thank you for all your support um, as, we've, as we've rolled this out and for the spirit with which you approach this in saying that this is an ambitious effort. We've tried our best to respond to a pressing need. And we always have in mind that for each family, if they don't have care on a specific day, that is an emergency that takes up, it's, it's their whole world. And so we, we keep that in mind, even as we're dealing with big, big numbers. Um, I, I think as far as challenges go, um, I think just it, it's, it has just been a, an effort to go as, as fast as we can. Um, I, I don't think there have been particular challenges other than to say, you know, in areas where um, we've always experienced difficulties in finding um, vacant space um, that's suitable for, for after school and early childhood programs, those areas of the city do tend to be tougher. And so we're working hard to find partners there um, that can work with us, um, um, you know, particularly I, I would say Staten Island Chair Rose is one of those places, as you know, you've been terrific in working with us on that in, in Southern Brooklyn and in, in, you know, in our community school district 24 in Queens in the Flushing's Corona area. Those are, those are areas of the city where we've always struggled with school capacity, after school capacity, early childhood capacity, and it's, it's no different here. And so in particular, if you have leads for us, uh, for organizations that wanna work with us, we'd be very happy to hear them. As far as challenges in citing pro programs in schools, I think our agencies have been working quite well together, though again, there's capacity issues in those areas where schools are already struggling, um, especially given the added constraint of social distancing to create space for these programs. But I will turn it over to, um, to Associate Commissioner um, Daryl Rattray just to, to fill in the, the gaps there. Good morning, Chair Rose. So it's a Answer your question around, uh, I'll answer it twofold. One, um, some of the concerns that you would, uh, you mentioned that providers are having within schools. Um, I'm assuming, and from the feedback that we've received from providers, that that's coming in from the after school world of this, not the learning lab side. Um, and from the after school side, um, imagine that we've gotten up over 90% of our school based after school programs. Of course, there are some where we are still dealing with um, facility logistics, I'll call it, um, where principals are just ensuring that the right thing is happening in spaces where um, the COVID rates are high um, within those communities. And we're working with the nonprofits, we're working with the principals in the schools to rectify those issues. So we do expect to get those programs up and running in person as soon as possible, but we are triaging them on a case by case basis. Um, the one positive amazing thing is that we do have 11 learning labs within school buildings and these are locations where uh, based on a young, the number of students that are in blended learning, um, we actually identified spaces within that school where a nonprofit or existing nonprofits who have been amazing um, have now activated learning labs within those spaces. Um. Thank you. Uh, learning lab providers are matched to schools and can only serve students in their programs who attend those schools. On October 23rd, DYCD notified learning lab providers that their number of matched schools would be increased, allowing additional students to participate in their learning lab programs. In some cases, this resulted in learning lab programs being matched to too many schools. Um, how, how do you um, plan to address that? Uh, hey guys, if you can unmute Deputy Commissioner Hassel. Got it. Thank you, thank you. Um, Chair Rose, I'm, uh, you know, I'm pleased to report that we moved away from this initial policy of matching schools to students. Um, this was a great approach to target students with highest need. Um, we've been clear up front, we want to get this service to the ones who needed it most. Uh, but then we started looking at where demand was coming in and the applications and the school matching and we realized we could broaden the eligibility and we took that step a couple of weeks ago. And at that point, we've been able to offer thousands more people a seat. It's why you see, you know, high numbers now in comparison to the applications. 
um, that approach really freed us up to, to reach some of the families who really needed it, but who weren't attending um, schools that had been yet matched to a learning lab program. So I think um, we're gonna see a real uptick uh, now that we've you know, initiated that by starting to send offers to, to, to more students. And it allowed us to open up the preference to families so that now um, when they're signing up, they can make a choice about what's the best fit for them rather than the city saying, you know, this is where you, need, where you, where you can go. You know, um, this program um, was morphed from the REC, the REC programs, and, um, and it was supposed to provide, you know, um, the ability for essential workers to go to work and leave their children in a safe environment um, where they would get um, educational support and, and other enhancement services. And um, this, the program, the learning lab program is now um, just from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m which um, is very difficult um, to, uh, it, it doesn't really accommodate the needs of, of working parents. And um, if a parent has to be at work at eight or nine, there's no way that they can, you know, take their child to a, a, a center at that, at eight o'clock and, and be to work on time. And same on the back end, being able to pick up their child at, at three o'clock. Um, is there any plans to look at the, the time frame that the uh, learning labs um, are actually operational? And um, is there some plan to help morph them into the after school programming so that this actually becomes a, a program that works for working parents? Because as it is, it, it, it doesn't address the needs of essential workers. And, and I know that's why, you know, I wind up with, with you know, my grandkids in the afternoon because um, there's no way a parent can pick them up at three o'clock and, and be at work. So is there some sort of, you know, there's two questions there. Yeah. Are, are you going to address those issues? Yeah, I'll I'll start. There's, there are a few there are a few things to that, and I'll I'll welcome DOE to weigh in. I'm not going to speak too much to Rex in particular because it's really a very different. No, no, model. Rex. Are, no, I don't want yeah. you to deal with. Okay, that. good. Okay, um, but also I'm a lifelong advocate for the three to six p.m. period, both because it met um, child care needs, meets child care needs that are essential for working parents, and it's really important for young people's development for them to use those hours to be engaged in enriching activities. Um, at the same time, we did build up uh, learning bridges and as an alternate to the school day. So with a commitment to give them the hours that they, they would have had without a pandemic if their child was enrolled in school five days a week. So that was the model that we launched. But we've heard um, from many parents and we've heard from advocates like you that there are still families who need more support. That, that was true before the pandemic and that continues to be true. So we are exploring uh, ways and regions where we might be able to expand those hours either in the morning or in the afternoon to provide additional support. And uh, we look forward to getting back to you about that. Okay. Um, many of our UJA providers have been able to relocate current staff to work in their learning lab programs while others had to hire new staff However, um, DOHMH has struggled to complete the background checks in a timely manner, causing up to two month delays in the hiring process for staff members in learning labs. What is DYCD um, doing or have you done um, or is planning to do to assist DOHMH in expediting the comprehensive background check process? Will DYCD hold learning lab providers harmless for under enrollment in their programs due to not having enough staff cleared to work with children and youth? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to pull in my colleague Tracy Cauldron if she could be unmuted to to give a response to this because she's been working, you know, helping to connect with Department of Health. Um, and I'll just say why she's getting unmuted. 
um, it's not really funny, but sometimes I have to laugh to myself when the new federal background clearance guidelines came back last September, I was confident this would be the biggest obstacle to our providers to, to, to bringing childcare program as they had in the past and then March 2020 hit and for sure that was not that that was not the biggest obstacle um, hitting childcare but so we've been attuned to that need since before the the pandemic and um, maybe Tracy could talk speak a little bit more about um, Tracy if you want to raise your hand maybe that'll help them find you to unmute we're um, we're having an issue that it's not unmuting so we're sending an unmute um, you have to accept the unmute request um, so there is a delay in unmuting so if members could use the raise hand function in zoom um, if you're going to be answering questions that we can do that in advance just hit unmute okay and I think this call is unmuted. thank you I am thank you um so yeah so due to a, a, a regulation a federal regulation change there has been um, a um, a slowdown in the clearance process. Uh, and uh, we've experienced that um, when it first uh, was enacted. But to our knowledge, currently, there hasn't been any impact to the learning labs um, uh, due to the, the clearance process or the new clearance process. And we welcome uh, and invite you to let us know uh, about providers and programs that um, have uh, communicated that there has been a impact to their particular programs, um, but we are not aware of any um, impact in, uh, or any programs that have been inhibited uh, to provide services to any learning lab or learning bridges participants. But we uh, initially, when the law was enacted, we provided support resources. We had trainings um, to support our programs and our providers to um, become uh, knowledgeable about the process. And so um, we did uh, initially provide that support uh, to help aid in um, speeding up the clearances uh, on our side. I'll just add to that that the learning labs programs are operating, you know, in a very different way than our community based art organizations are used to operating where they really manage at the local level their their direct outreach to families and their enrollment processes. So this is a much more centralized approach than they're used to. So I think um, to Tracy's point, what we, you know, we're not aware of any young person alert bridges program who couldn't be served because we didn't have enough cleared staff, even though we know staff clearing um, can, be, can be a barrier. But, um, you know, we're, we're funding programs, learning lab programs, the same way we fund other youth services programs in any um, time at DYCD. You have a contract value, you're, you're con you, must, you provide the service you're contracted for, and then you're reimbursed um, through your approved expenses. I, don't, I, I welcome... So my colleague, Jadine Fenor, if she wants to add anything to that. All right, thank you, Susan. Just to repeat one more time, I got distracted with a, um, an, an incoming text. What is it that you wanted me to cover specifically? Uh, Chair Rose, your question was about, I think was about reimbursement, reimbursing providers as they continue to ramp up their enrollment. So thank you, thank you for clarifying. Good morning, Chair Rose. Um, we want one of the things that we want to stress is that of the approximate 170 contracts that we have, currently almost 119 of them have existing um, base contracts. And so what my team has been doing um, on a, a continuous basis is if a provider reaches out and is having cash flow issues, we are assessing what their base contracts look like before contracts are registered so that we can make sure that providers are getting the financial assistance that is needed. Um, okay, um, because um, so you're saying that DYCD will compensate learning lab providers for the full amount of their FY21 contracts, regardless of their daily attendance at their programs. Um, and when would they be able to expect compensation and reimbursement? 
So just to reiterate again, reimbursement as um, contracts get registered, we are definitely reimbursing. If before registration happens and a provider needs um, assistance, cash flow assistance, we are doing a contract by contract assessment. And if they have a base contract, we're tapping in to make sure that they can access some of that funding upfront um, while they wait for their new contracts to be registered. Okay. Um, I, I've taken a lot of time and I, I wanna be fair to my co-chair. Um, so I'll come back. I'll, I'll ask other questions. I have a lot. Um, Chair Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair Rose. Um, yeah, we there. There are a lot of questions. I really appreciate uh, the ones you've already asked, and and um, I, I have a few follow up questions to those. Let's just start with the last point. I think um, what Chair Rose was asking was. Um, a little different than the answer, I think. Um, so let's say a contract is approved for a provider. And um, I understand uh, that then um, the uh, reimbursement will happen as soon as the invoice is sent in and you're helping to smooth things over, which is great. I think the question is, and especially because the way you've talked about the funding is per person, the question is, is the reimbursement per person or is it for the entire value of a full program? In other words, if, if the program promises 30 seats, but only 20 kids show up, could be different kids, but only 20 kids show up every single day. Um, will the provider be paid for 30 children or 20 children? So I'm going to ask that you unmute Navita and I'm going to start the, res um, the response to your specific question. Providers, listen, we follow the provider's lead. The provider is going to send, they have access. If they have a contract, they have access to their entire contract amount. We are reimbursing based on what they submit as expenditures. So I think what I want to stress, it is the provider who is going to kind of lead that charge, right? And submit what is needed in terms of expenditures, right? The PPP that we mentioned um, um, which was approximately 7,800, right? Includes several different things, several different components. And so as providers submit their um, reimbursement and they're asked, we're reimbursing. And I think um, to answer your larger question, yes, we have all intention and we are committed to paying providers for the slots and seats that they have been contracted for. I don't know, Navita, if you wanna add anything to that. So good morning, this is Navita. Hi, Chair Rosenbaum. So um, I just wanna just expand on that. Reimbursement is not based on performance. And so I think your original question is, is this a performance-based contract and where reimbursement will be based on performance? Reimbursement is based on what is submitted in an invoice as Judith indicated. And so providers will not be held um, to account regarding under-enrollment if they're unable to fully enroll their participants. Um, as long as they're, um, expenses submitted on the invoice are eligible, consistent with our fiscal manual, they'll be reimbursed. So I just wanna make sure that's clear that that is not um, tied to reimbursement for providers. I hope that answers your question. Totally, that was so clear. Thank you. Um, because I'm hearing from providers that yeah, their overhead is the same, whether or not a child shows up, but you could see that fewer PPE you know, is used. Um, because there are fewer children. Okay, great, thank you. That was very clear. Um, I'm gonna go back to the top just for a second. Uh, and just as a baseline, um, Deputy Commissioner Haskell, are you using, uh, is the city using in its testimony and its answers, um, learning lab, learning bridges, sort of interchangeable or fused together? So in other words, like what we just discussed about reimbursement. Can I assume that's true for Learning Bridges and Learning Labs? 
or are your answers only in regards to learning labs? That is a great question. I'm going to welcome um, Josh to weigh in. Uh, we DYCD is is you know contracting the learning labs part K to eight. Learning Bridges is the whole initiative. Um, because this is a youth services hearing, we're focused on learning labs. And I apologize, I sometimes use the term interchangeably. With all the supports we have of DOE and our partnership here, we're able to off answer a lot of questions about the Learning Bridges initiative overall. So thank you for clarifying that for people who are listening as well. Um, I, I've been using those sometimes interchangeably. Um, I, Josh, I welcome you to reply to the reimbursement question. Sure, I'm. I'm. Um, I appreciate it. I'm jumping in whenever there's a whenever there's a difference. Um, and, and so in this case, it's the same. Um, we also pay for the capacity, recognizing that you know, um, as you as you mentioned, Chair Rosenthal, uh, providers have fixed costs to open a classroom, and um, uh, we consider this a partnership. And so you know, it's incumbent upon us to help make sure that families connect to these sites to get the care they need, and for us to make sure that the organizations have what they need to run a quality, safe, and healthy program for them. Fantastic, thank you. Um, these are a tiny bit random, but I, as I said, I'm just asking follow-up questions to the ones that Council Member Rose asked. Um, I'm wondering about the applicants who turn who turned down their placement in September because Perhaps the placement was an hour away, and so it just didn't help them. Are you aggressively going back to those applicants now that you have more sites to offer them a slot? Well, I want to say that, yes, there is the opportunity, as you mentioned, to, to, to come back into the portal and re-up your application, pick, select a different site. Um, and yes, we are um, working on outreach strategies constantly. We, we appreciate your support with that. Uh, we're, we're looking to different audiences we need to communicate with to say this resource is still available. We want you to apply if you need it. We know how critical it is to your day to day. Um, so, so well, yes to both. Yeah, I mean, wouldn't it just be a simple automatic almost, you could do it through the application process, you could see who applied, didn't accept their placement, and therefore automatically a letter goes out saying, please reapply. We can do that. We will keep outreach. We really want to focus. We're not sure we have all the demand that out yep. there. We probably don't. We need, we need to um, communicate with those families that have already applied and families who haven't yet applied and let them know that the resource is available. I hear what you're we're saying. Actually, we're actually about to, uh, uh, we're about to go out this week with notices to families that have applied, just letting them know where there are new opportunities. Just your point, Chair Rosenthal. So right. we're, we're, that, that'll happen in the next few days and we'll continue to do that. We're, we're just upgrading these systems as we go and, and making more and more possible with each week. So thanks for the suggestion. Makes sense. Um, you mentioned in your testimony that uh, a library in my district, the St. Agnes branch, um, will soon uh, be open as I think a learning lab. Um, I'm wondering um, when would um, applicants know about that? And how many seats will be there, stuff like that. Yeah, the, um, without getting too much into the specifics, I'm not sure how many seats they have, but the process, and um, Josh, correct me if I'm wrong, is the minute a site comes online, we notify DOE to dig into the application pool and notify all eligible families who are in that area that they can connect with this provider and offer them the contact information. And in fact, if, they're, if they've applied and they're a priority, um, in a priority group, we're going to let them know you have priority for this seat, and we're going to let the provider know that too. Right. We we put out notice as as soon as a new offer, uh, as soon as a new site comes online, we let eligible families in the area know, and we make matches weekly. So, so we're on a weekly pace. Wow. And okay. we add those sites to the website, so they'll be you know visible to the public on the DOE website. 
And just adding that the St. Agnes Library will have 105 seats. Nice. Wow. Operated by After School All Stars. Um, so that's a lot of seats. Very exciting. It's a big library that makes a lot of sense. And also confirming that the library is not open to the public. So it'll only be used for um, this program. And is the program um, from eight to three? I asked that question or eight to six because the name of the provider includes the words after school. That's correct. The, pro, the old learning lab programs are open from 8 to 3 p.m. Um, coincidentally, the provider's name is After School All Stars, but that's their official provider name. And, yeah. confer, and double confirming um, your point that, yes, libraries are closed to the public and we're working with the library systems as well as the nonprofits that will be operating out of the libraries for proper signage because, of course, folks are going to see activity and try to walk in. So we'll be sure to put proper signage outdoor, I mean, out front on the entrances as well. Yeah, terrific. A lot of families sort of around there who will need, who need service. Um, you know, uh, the way, the answers I'm hearing, I think, um, so my question is, would you be able to send uh, the council sort of a chart of by council district, um, how many applications and how many filled. Um, and the reason I asked that question, and I sort of hear Josh in your mind thinking, well, it gets updated every week. So how could we do that? Um, and I hear that, but um, my frustration is that I'm hearing different things from different people. Um, one provider told me that they tried to apply, but were told that there was no demand in my district. Um, and it sounds like that wasn't true or else you wouldn't have set up a 101 seat provider. Um, is there any way to do that in a point of time or, and the reason would be, of course, we send out weekly emails and if there's space available, I would love to be able to tell my eblast list that that is the case and maybe flyer uh, some of the low income buildings around me. Yes, yeah, so we can definitely get you a list of programs by council district. Absolutely. It, or, or that's terrific. Yeah. Although I can go on your site and pull out mine, but I, more importantly for the information of the council member and maybe I don't know, maybe in your high priority areas. Um, so council members could know to reach out if there are applicants that haven't gotten a site yet. So in other words, the Delta to know the Delta between those who applied and those who got seats. It's a big okay. Yeah, we will work with DOE on that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think we can. I think we can um, let us look at what data we're able to pull and how quickly. But we, I, I, I understand what you're looking for, and I think we would, um, we would share that information just in the spirit of trying to work together to fill gaps where there are gaps. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, so yes, let us look into that, um, and uh, we'll get back to you very shortly. And obviously, the date would have to be yeah. front center. Yeah. All right, great, thank you. Um, and then I'm wondering, uh, in your testimony, you mentioned that um, Learning Labs uh, and Bridges um, are, are basically free childcare options for children from 3K through eighth grade on days when they are scheduled for remote learning. I'm wondering, um, should the schools close down, and perhaps you already answered this, but should the schools close for any reason, are, are will the learning lab and learning bridge sites remain open? Uh, yes, and I, I did say that in that in the testimony. <clears throat> um, and we have, you know, we've been preparing as we watch the news and we see that there's uh, some uptick in the cases. We've been preparing providers. We sent an email out to the K to eight groups on Friday, just saying, listen, if schools are to shut down, 
um, please remain open, continue to serve your families, and expect that you'll have families asking for more days of the week. Um, so we want to, um, the way the data is right now, it looks like in many cases, maybe in most cases, we would be able to accommodate additional days. Um, families will need to communicate that to the provider to let them know um, that, that they're interested and uh, allow the provider to you know, set up a new schedule based on prob probably families who will have more need and potentially families who don't want to come in person under those circumstances and will be prepared for, for both. So yeah, we, we, uh, we will be open and we'll be trying to um, do more to get to meet the childcare needs if they're no if they aren't in person on some school days. Yeah, we, re we reached out to preschool providers as well late last week, um, just to also let them know that the plan is that they'd be open um, if if schools should close. Sorry to interrupt. Got it. And I assume you're tracking the rate positive rate of COVID at each one of the sites on a regular basis and following the same rules the DOE does, where if it hits a certain number, you close down the site. Great. Um, I well, these, no, no, uh, so just to say, the, the sorry to interrupt, but I just want to clarify, the, the community-based organizations that run preschool learning bridges and 3K and pre-K, we are looking at the statistics, of course, but they will remain open, even if the citywide positivity rate goes above 3%, um, just to say. Right, um, if there's specific sites Ah, yes, all of those cases would be reported into the situation room. They're all part of the same rules. Um, there, it's not about a percentage. It's about um, um, and more than, it's about a number of cases that are not linked to one another um, that um, to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and, and our health experts means that there's a reason to um, shut the site completely. So uh, those, those cases are reported, as I think um, um, uh, Susan Haskell said in her testimony, into the same system as the schools and are treated the same way. Luckily, we've seen very, very few cases in Learning Bridges sites so far, either on the preschool or school age side. So that's great news. Great, that's impressive. All right, my last set of questions um, for this round have to do with the students with disabilities. Um, so, uh, so are seats available, are Learning Lab seats available uh, in terms of, you know, actual reality for D75 students, students with IEPs, yes or no? And, and do you have numbers, do you have any numbers around that? Yes, yes, we are open for students with disabilities. Um, I appreciate that question. I. Um, I, on a personal note, I'm so grateful every day that my children are grown and no longer school age. I appreciate the point that you and Chair Rose made earlier about how challenging this is, especially on moms. Uh, my colleagues, I, you know, you, you see the kids sometimes coming into the work halls and it's a great interruption, but the reality of trying to balance is, is unbelievable. And my own student who got specialized services since age two, I can imagine how difficult this is for families. So it's a, it's especially hard for families of students with disabilities or, or special needs. And um, we, we have made matches. So 9,000 of the students that we talked about being matched to a program are students with IEPs. Um, and we absolutely, I know of cases that have been shared with me by specific providers of services going well for students with, with disabilities. At the same time, you know, we're ramping up a system which is, you know, meant as an alternative to the school day during blended learning. And the learning labs programs just don't have the same level of supports that a school has um, through the Office of School Sports and Office, Office of Spe Special Education. So there are cases coming to our attention and we will continue to work to meet the no needs of those families. We have individualized support. Um, my colleague, Tracy Cauldron, um, I know Department of Education because very often we're working together on what we can do to in improve accommodations. We're also looking at, at whether there are sites where we could add more staff so that um, you know, we built our program off the childcare ratios, one to 10, one to 15, and that's not adequate in some cases for our young people. So we know we have um, more work to do with this, but we also know 
that we are seeing many successes for students with disabilities. So we just have to keep this as a priority um, and we will continue to do that. Okay, uh, it's, it's great to hear 9,000 kids um, have been with IEPs have been matched. Can I assume that they were matched either in schools where there's space for it or in, um, or it was situations where they don't need a para, these kids? Yeah, it may have been a situation where they don't need a para. I'm, I think we have programs that are actually, you know, finding a way to provide uh, para support as well. And I'll ask, um, you know, Josh, if he wants to add any to anything to this, but we, um, we're not specifically matching students to school based programs. Um, and so most of the examples that I know are actually in our community based programs. I know SOBRO, Coalition for Hispanic Family Services, Children's Aid, these are the some of the programs that we've been working with directly to help place students. Um, there hasn't been a specific effort to match them to the school programs. Yeah, I think I'm sorry. No, I was just making it up, given that one of the reasons for not matching was space. But please, yeah. No, I think that's just right. I mean, we are um, we're looking at whichever setting can can support um, the, the students with disabilities. We're finding a lot of community-based organizations are are stepping up and saying that they can do so. I, I do want to just be, you know, I, I think I think we, as we said, we 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 acknowledge we have more work to do here. I think it's. Um, it is a top priority for us to be able to serve all the students with disabilities that need learning bridges um, on days that they're not in person. Um, and we at the Department of Education have been working very hard with uh, BYCD and, and our special education office is deeply involved in trying to make sure that we improve these services as quickly as we can um, and trying to get services into the community-based organizations or the schools for that matter um, for kids who need them. It's, it's an, you know, we, we appreciate sort of the the the, um, the attention here, and and it just agree that it's a real priority and that we have more to do. Um, but we're making some progress, as Susan pointed out. We do have thousands of kids that are um, in sites and getting the services they need. Um, we we'll just have to keep pushing. I mean, uh, it'd be great if you could actually be specific. Um, so, how many of the nine thousand need Paris, and um, yeah. And, and I guess it would be how many of the nine that, first of all, how many applied? Yeah. And then how many got a placement? Yeah, we don't have those numbers now. I will say, I think we are having trouble in particular replicating that para service that you're referring to. That is a challenge for us. We're trying to add more staff to you know, give better services. Uh, we want to improve. Let us come back to you with the numbers. Uh, we're happy to, you know. For sure, but so have you negotiated, obvious, so you negotiate a contract with a provider and obviously the providers that have the capacity to have additional staff and, you know, um, take uh, D75 kids or someone who needs a, a paraprofessional, um, wouldn't that contract by definition have more, have a higher reimbursement level because they have a higher number of staff? Well, at this point, we, we have a base contract and, and all of our programs are funded at that base contract level. Um, and I think, you know, I wanna give credit to all our providers um, really working with families to make accommodations whenever possible. Sometimes providers themselves are engaged in this work, you know, outside of the Learning Labs program. So they have a higher level of, you know, resources within the agency that maybe they can pull in or they just have expertise and they're better equipped to, um, to meet the needs. So um, we are looking at adding resources potentially for additional staff. At this point, we have a single we have a single model and we're doing our best within that model, but we are exploring whether additional resources could move us further uh, toward fully meeting the need. Yeah, I mean, let the record show the answer to that question was no. 
Um, and that, you know, and of course you're, you're thinking about it, but the answer is no. Um, so in other words, up to now, there's sort of no, you know, a provider would have to pull from other resources if they were gonna take a student and it, if they had to provide a para. I mean, I, it's just an important distinction to make. Um, Let's you're right. We we you're right. We did not set up a program that was, you know, fully equipped again, designed with the with the full set of resources that are available through the Department of Education. And that's the challenge that we're gonna continue to push through. Yeah. And yeah. that's why the partnership is so important. I mean, I think we are you know, this is a this is a a, a top area of focus for us right now. Um, you know, literally today and tomorrow and the next day, we hear you loud and clear and and we've heard from families as well. We are working right now with our special education office to try to find solutions here that might be possible. So um, I think we understand it's a priority. Let us work a little bit more with our partners at DYCD, um, and we can we can update you in, in the you know in the days to come about our progress. Um, but again, it's it's a real focus for us, and I, I we really hear you. Yeah. Um, I'll be well. I'll get to budget questions in a minute. So I'm just gonna read a couple of questions. I think you already answered them, but I just wanna make sure I heard the right answer, um, heard the accurate answer. Um, so how many requests has DYCD received from parents or programs for accommodations or supports, including the paraprofessional support for students with disabilities? I don't know if we have that specific number. I can call on my call. Yeah, I don't think we have that data. I can, you know, I have one colleague here who I know has been doing some individualized supports. She could talk about the cases that she's been working with. I don't think it would paint the full picture that you're looking for. Um, so we can, you know, again, to Josh's point, let us regroup on this and try to help give you what you're looking for to get you the information you need. Right. I mean, if, you, if the answer really is don't know, um, that means that in your tracking system, you don't have a box check here for we'll need a paraprofessional, we'll need additional support. You're not even asking, like if you don't know, that means you're not collecting the data because you're so good on giving us the information about other data. Yeah. So does that mean you're not asking the question in the application? is my question to you. I we are starting to collect the data. I think that, again, I think some of this is, uh, um, as you as you pointed out, we understand it's a, a real priority, which is why we've worked so hard and accelerated to offer slots to these um, to, to, to kids. And that said, I think we, we have more work to do on our side um, to collect this data and to give you sort of a full response on what our approach will be. We do know, um, who, which students have IEPs in our, we, we know that. Um, and then we work with the program to make sure that they're able to meet um, what the services that are mandated on the IEP. What we don't have right here and now is the number of students with an IEP that, which may, in, in which cases the mandated services require a para. Um, so that's the breakdown that we're missing. Um, but I think what you're pointing out, the larger issue is, do we have a comprehensive approach to make sure that in every case we're able to get through the, our special education office, the services that that child needs to sort of thrive in learning bridges? I think there we have more to go. And I, I think we just need to keep you posted in the, in, in the next couple of weeks about how we mend that. Yep, yep. And to recognize that many, many young people who apply will be successfully served in the mainstream learning labs programs. And we do say, if you need additional support, here's where to reach out. And that's where we're getting that individualized attention that, that Tracy's been working on. Yeah, that's confusing. Um, so Josh, when you say you know how many kids have IAPs, that's the 9,000 number? Yes. And what you don't know is how many people applied. You know that 9,000 have been served. Right. 
That's right. in the larger, that 9,000 is part of the larger number that we led with. So most yeah. of them are being served, yes. Well, you don't know how many applied. You didn't we, report how we many. We know that most of the children that are in priority categories that applied are being served. So uh, they're part of that larger group. Yeah. Um, it'd be helpful to know that number and to think hard about that number. Um, and then I guess my question would, would be, I think you said Tracy might know this answer. Um, how many parents then, because it would be on the parent, proactively reach out and ask for additional support? What's the number of people who have reached out? What's the number of people who have gotten that support? And I mentioned that it's, proactive because that means a parent has to assume, has to know that those supports are not being given, even though they were given at the rec center. So, you know, I would, you know, that exists. So um, you're gonna get back to me with those numbers. Yes. Okay. and. Um, I forgot. Um, how many, do you know how many requests for paraprofessionals or other sports have been granted? No, but I think you're, you know, you're directing us to an area where we are like to Josh's point, we're putting more attention as we've, you know, gotten some traction with this program, learned a little bit more about what the special needs are of our applicants. And we will get back to you with more information. Yeah. And, um, Actually, Josh, in your answer, or, or both of you, your answers have seemed to focus on learning bridges for the youngest children. Does, do your answers apply both to bridges yes. and labs? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. We're, we're, we, we've responded to, um, to needs in both programs and are working to focus even more on that. And I will add, I, I think this is another case where um, we want to work on the overall approach. Um, and also, we'd like to partner with you because really each parent that we've heard from, uh, um, we've, we've responded to and, so, and supported. And we want to have a systemic approach so that it, it's more automatic. But also, if, you, if you're aware of particular cases where folks are having challenges, uh, um, we, wanna, we want to um, re respond as quickly as possible. Josh, that's quite an assertion, I, and I'm not going to dwell on it. I'm okay. just going to go on, but everyone who's reached out has been accommodated, but I asked a minute ago how many have reached out, how many have been accommodated. So I don't, I don't, I hear you. Most who have reached out have gotten accommodated. I, I just, we need to be careful about assertions. Understood. Um, yeah. We'll okay. show our work. We need to come back to you. I get it. I appreciate that. Um, and specifically in the application process, um, does the city, is there a process, is there a place for families to request um, the additional supports? There is a contact for outreach to walk through that process. But there's uh, nothing in the initial application that says, I'm sorry, I think I already asked this, but there's nothing in the, it, 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 I understand there's a phone number if someone can be proactive, but is there a box? I'm sorry, I think I already asked that question. That no, no, there is not a box on the application, but the reason for that is that when we get an application, since these, these um, children are all enrolled in, in New York City public schools, we match their application to data that we already have about the student. And so we know whether they have an IEP. And so we don't have to ask the family to re-input data that they've already given us. We're trying to do less and less of that. For so sure. we just capture enough information to know which student we're dealing with. And then we try to do the rest we can, um, the best we can with, with, with the information we have. And then there's an additional email address if, if families want to reach out with us with more information or have issues or questions. Yeah, I mean, the only flaw in that approach, I, I, and I respect that, I mean, that says volumes about your um, data system, that's great. Um, but for um, 
it doesn't answer the question really for the learning bridges because I would imagine many of those kids are not enrolled in a school yet. Maybe. Oh, right. oh in preschool programs, they would be. Uh, um, as soon as they're in a, as, if they're enrolled in 3K or pre-K, and that's, that's right. who, who. I'm just who, saying there, there are those who are not enrolled in 3K and pre-K. That's all. Got it. Got it. And that might be the way to ask the question. If you are not currently enrolled in a school, please check here if you will need uh, additional supports for your child. Yeah, okay. I think that's where it's just important. And I, I, I think we're both, we're both, we both have the same goal here. Um, and, and forgive me for just clarifying, but I do wanna make sure as folks are watching that they understand clearly only um, children who are already enrolled in a Department of Education school or program in blended learning are eligible for um, learning bridges. Um, so in order to be, in order for a preschool age child to, to apply, they have to be in 3K or pre-K. And if they are, then they're in our data systems and we know whether they have um, a, 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 a need, a, an IEP. So um, just, so, just, so, just so we're clear, at this point, if, the, if folks are not enrolled in a DOE school or program, um, they're, they're, they're not, they're not eligible for a learning bridges slot. And that's just important to clarify for, for, for those who may be watching. Thank you. I really appreciate that clarification. In other words, you could be income eligible, but not enrolled in DOE, perhaps enrolled in a, um, religious school and you're not eligible. How about charter kids? They are not eligible at this time. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, quick, I'm going to ask you um, just, I'm going to go back to funding for just a quick second. Um, uh, do the learning labs and bridges serve families in homeless shelters or homeless hotels? And how do those families find out about the program? We have been work again working closely with our partners of in at DOE, including the uh, students in temporary housing, the office for the students in temporary housing. They've done direct and specific outreach to DOE enrolled families. Um, participating in blended learning to let them know about this option. In some cases, we've, you know, generated letters matching them to sites, you know, even before an, an expression of interest or at least alerting them to, to the ability to enroll in a site. So we've been very targeted toward, um, toward our homeless students in terms of making families aware that this opportunity exists and, uh, and making matches to programs. Right, and the family would have to have a computer in order to do this, obviously, right, to apply. Oh, that's right, the, um, the application is online. Mm -hmm. They would either, yeah, they would right. need have to be on. internet where, wherever they are. Families can also use 311. So if they don't have access to internet, but have access to a phone, they can call 311 and apply that way. Um, and we've also been sending offers you know, directly to 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 sites, um, you know, uh, so that families have have offers ready to go. Um, again, without without internet. I'm glad you're again saying this for the public. Um, so it's really helpful to know. Do you have a total budget? Do, is there a number in the city's budget for learning labs and for learning bridges? But let's start with learning labs. It does DYCD have a line in the budget that says amount for learning labs? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this to my fiscal team if we could unmute Jadine Fanor and and Navita Bailey. Um, and just while they're doing that, I'll note um, it is a, a a rolling initiative. In other words, we continue to add sites. Um, and I see they're unmuted now, so I'll let them take it. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Um, look, we, we know that we have a rate um, and um, we have a targeted number of kids that we want to serve. Um, and it could change based on COVID and school enrollment. 
However, we're still working with the state on funding eligibility and don't have a breakdown of the exact amount of funding um, type yet. What I can say to you is through the contract negotiations that we have done thus far, we have approximately or have obligated approximately $133 million um, towards um, the Learning Labs initiative. And again, I want to reiterate what Susan is saying, that it's a rolling, obviously, based on need. And as we work through the details on the back end, um, we are going to be committed to reimbursing. Um, I understand. What, so funding for this program, how much is city funded? How much is state funded? That's so I'm going to reiterate again. That's what we are working behind the scenes on making sure we still are in conversations with the state and we don't have that funding type detail yet. What we do know is based on what we have negotiated thus far, we are at about 133 million. When we get the details behind how it's going to be funded, whether it's city funding, whether it's state, we will give you more clarity but we're still working behind the scenes to flesh out those details. So in the November plan, when I look at the DYCD budget, hypothetically, no, there would be a line that says 133 million in expenses. So you won't see expenses because they're not all incurred yet. Um, look, we're working, we're working well, very closely. Versus budget. I'm just saying in the November plan, which is budget. Are you going to have a budgeted amount in there? Or I want to. Sorry to interrupt you, Chair. I'm sorry. To it interrupt. is our intention to work very closely with OMB and our other partners to make sure that we can solidify the funding. Again, what we're trying to do behind the scenes is work with the state on um, what funding is going to be available from their ends and looking at several different pots to see where this funding is gonna materialize. What I can say is that it's not going to impact the way that we reimburse our providers. We will not leave them in a ditch. We are going to figure it out, but I don't have the level of detail that you're looking for, which we normally have, and we are going to get you that information as soon as possible. Right, no, actually, I understand that. If you can't show where the revenues are coming from, you you hold off on showing it in the budget as an expense and revenue on quite a few programs. Um, and so you wait until you get the revenue in and then you show both. Um, I understand that, um, but it does mean that it does mean that at some point there will be city funds needed um, to cover costs, obviously. Um, and hopefully the re state will, you know, stop holding back. It's what, $2 billion um, and can step up to help fund this program. Um, From your mouth to God's ears, <laughs> we hope the same. <laughs> I'm hoping they're hearing me when I'm saying that because it's certainly so am I. Um, okay, uh, hang on one second. I have a constituent at the door, so this timing is good. Um, Councilmember Rose, Chair Rose, I'm going to push it back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Chair Rosenthal. Um, I was just wondering um, uh, uh, to, to piggyback on uh, Chair Rosenthal's uh, budget questions. Um, does D DOE provide any funding in DYCD's budget for learning labs? Um, and if so, how much? And, um, and, what, and what funding category is it coming from? Uh, Jadine, I'll turn to you for that. So were you asking specifically for DOE? Because I yes, mentioned, yes, yes, yes. So I think that's Josh. Uh -huh. I can't speak to DOE's budget. 
Does yeah. I, I, I don't. I don't think we not, have funds from DOE in the DOE budget right now. No. no. Oh, so I thought you were asking for the funding on in terms of Learning Bridge and where we are in terms of obligations. So excuse me for that. No, nothing is coming from DOE into DYCD's budget currently. No. Okay. Is is that um, a possible uh, funding stream? Uh, is is that one of the the streams that we're looking at in terms of? Um, the $132 million or, or more? Um, currently, no, it's more of a revenue um, situation that we're looking at, definitely not from DOE. Um, Gosh, you got some money you wanna throw at us? <laughs> I was gonna say, we're all, we're all in the same boat here. We all are, are, are looking hard um, at ways to fund the initiative. Okay, I just want to ask one question before um, I, I give uh, the floor to my, my colleagues. You know, um, when we were talking about uh, the Learning Lab sites, have there been any issues around food supply and um, to the Learning Lab sites? And specifically, um, I've been approached uh, about um, in regard to access to nutritious kosher foods. And has DYCD explored um, ways that maybe the learning lab providers can use their own kosher caterers and be reimbursed for providing the meals, which um, would be eliminated, um, which would eliminate travel requirements as well as ensure that these meals are um, are high quality. I can answer that question. Thank you, Chris. So we work very closely with DYCB as well as the other Learning Bridges program to know the number of students at each facility. We're providing meals for all of those sites, including the sites at uh, Learning Labs through DYCD. We're in constant contact with the team at DYCD. In fact, we just had a conference call a couple of hours ago about meals that are being provided there. We are also providing kosher meals at several sites, uh, DYCD Learning Lab sites. The meals that were requested were through the facility itself. We never got any student or parent kosher request, but we're still providing around 450 to 500 kosher meals a day at sites. There have been no supply chain issues. When there ever is a, an issue regarding a specific meal, we address it right away. We're in constant contact, like I said, and we're always open to, to hearing feedback and addressing anything that may come up. As far as sites using their own caterers, we're, we're providing the meals as a service. If a site wanted to go out and procure and pay for their own meals through a different service, they could definitely do that. We're just providing this option. Obviously, any DOE student that attends a Learning Bridges or Learning Lab program, we are getting reduced, uh, excuse me, reimbursed for those meals. So I think that's one of the advantages of, of the Learning Bridges labs using our service. So um, if they did go out and procure um, their own meals, um, they would not be, there would be no reimbursement for, for them. They can apply to be their own SFA, their own school food authority, if they would like to, but that's a long process for them to be able to do that. When we are providing meals, we're covered under our own SFA. New York City has the largest uh, school food supplier in the country. Obviously, we're getting reimbursed by the federal government. So the, the, the dots kind of line up, the T's of the cross when we're doing it. So we are getting reimbursed for every meal we serve, breakfast and lunch to a New York City student, whether they are in school person learning, whether they are providing uh, takeout meals or whether they are in the Learning Bridges or Land program. We will also provide meals, obviously, at the REC programs. I know we talked about that a little while ago. And just to bring up one other question, I don't think it was asked specifically. If the schools do close again and go full remote, my folks are essential. My folks work. We will continue to provide meals exactly the way we are providing meals today. We haven't had a day off since March. The only day, excuse me, the only day that we had off was Labor Day. We will continue to provide meals even over the holidays as well. Okay. Um, and uh, you might have said this, but um, what is the redress that they have if there are issues with the, the qualities of the, the quality of the meals? Every single site, Learning Labs or Learning Bridges, has a contact with one of my managers at the closest site where food is being picked up. They have to go directly to that person. I get involved 99% of the time to make sure the issue is resolved immediately, whether it's a manufacturing issue or a food service line issue. So they know exactly who to contact. And I am on about 90% of those emails when they come in. And we make sure they're addressed immediately. 
We don't want any issues happening, but serving the amount of meals that we do on a normal day, which is a million, during this time, it's a little bit less than 500,000. We know there may be an issue here or there. It's not acceptable, and we will address it as soon as we possibly can. Okay. Um, I just want to ask um, Commissioner Haskell, um, you know, uh, with the, um, in the attempt to increase the number of sites that we have, um, a number of people, a number of CBOs have applied to be, you know, um, uh, learning lab sites. Um, and there might have been a reason why they were, um, they were denied. Um, if they've taken measures to mitigate whatever those circumstances were, is there an appeal process for them to, uh, to sort of reapply and, um, and be, be considered? Uh, thank you for that question. I'm going to throw that to my colleague, Daryl Rattray, who can talk a little bit in general about the process for, for application. And uh, that should answer your question. Good morning again, Chair Rose. So I, I would answer this, I, I guess a fuller answer, and I'll get to the point where a provider may have been denied um, and whether or not there's an appeal process. So of course, any providers that are submitting f to operate a learning lab that's not an existing DYCD provider is going through the RFI. Right. Um, so the first step there is we get them through the RFI, our procurement department, uh, does a quick responsibility determination. They're checking to see that there's no adverse information on this particular provider. At that point, it becomes alphabet soup of city government. I'm sending it to DDC, FDNY, DOB, DCAS, EDC. We're looking at that site. We're doing site inspections. Someone's on the ground doing a walkthrough, making sure that that site is um, safe for childcare. Um, mm -hmm. At the point that we deem the site, the site safe, that it has a proper fire alarm systems, et cetera. Um, they go to what I am calling and what we are now coining as the final DYCD interview. Now, of course, as you all know, um, ordinarily at an initiative like this, we would have done a comprehensive RFP process because this is an RFI, um, folks are expressing interest um, quickly through the RFI. Um, so during this uh, final interview, if you will, it's a panel of DYCD staff. Um, we're discussing the experience of the organization, the plans they have for the learning lab, and the readiness they have to get the lab up and running. Um, if they don't pass that, if they pass the interview, we move them forward to a learning lab contract. If they don't pass, they got a declination letter from our procurement department. Um, if there's anything that they cleared up or if they feel that they may be ready to um, attempt again, if you will, they can send us a letter. Um, I don't know the timeline on that process on when we are going to entertain uh, going back to a, a set that got declined, um, but they can, they should certainly email us a letter um, indicating um, the details and that they are requesting another opportunity. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I, I now, um... I, I will now turn um, back to um, our moderator um, to call upon my colleagues for questions of this panel. Thank you so much, Chair Rose. Uh, we do not have any other council member questions at this time, it appears. If there are council members or anyone that has a question, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. We don't have any other questions. Okay, all right. So um, I've, um, before we move on, I just have- Oh, a sorry. Oh, apologies, Chair Rose. Uh, Chair Rosenthal is waving. I think she might have- Oh, okay. Question. Sorry, just a couple of follow-ups. Um, and Chair Rose, you really have nailed all of it. A quick follow-up question. <laughs> and I'm, I'm back to the budget for just one second. Um, are there any providers who have had their contracts modified and signed off on? We'll, we'll need to unmute Jadine and Navita to 
respond to that. And I suspect they'll want to hear a little more detail about what you mean by signed off and, and modified. Yes, many of our contracts are getting amendments at the existing provider group, not the RFI. Um, right. And there's so many layers of sign off. Um, go ahead. Yeah. What I mean is to the point where the controller can release the money if invoiced. And has anyone started invoicing? So I'm going to pivot to Navita because she's on that operational team. Navita, you want to get that? Sure. Um, so as of right now, we do not have any contracts or actions associated with learning labs that have been registered. So as of right now, no, they are in the process and we have almost three dozen that are um, in queue, whether they're be in rocks or at the controller's office um, for reimbursement. So that's in process. So as of right now, nothing is registered reflecting the learning lab initiative. Thank you. Um, so if I remember correctly, there were 100 contracts and of course some, you know, are for multiple sites. Correct. Were, um, that you're modifying or 117, I forget. Um, but your point being that some of those are already at the controller's office. So I'm going to just expand on that. So what um, Jadine Kunar was referring to earlier is that a number of contracts associated with the Learning Lab Initiative, about 70% or more, are actually amendments to existing contracts. So that means that if a provider has an existing registered contract that's based, they are able to submit an invoice and be reimbursed for it. So there should be no issues um, for the large part for most of our organizations to get reimbursed for delivering services. Wow, that's a great, interesting answer. So how many contracts are uh, in that stage? 117 of the 171 are um, have existing contracts. So 117 have existing contracts. That's where Navita was able to say approximately 70% of our total contracts have access to some cash flow. Uh, sorry, out of 100, 117 out of how many? 171 contracts. Got it. And for those 117, how many can right today submit an invoice? They all can. They all can. Full stop. Anyone? Uh, full, they, stop. They, yeah, full stop. Full <laughs> stop. All these programs, as a reminder, many of these programs have existing after school contracts or a whole host of other contracts. They can, they are currently operational. They can submit an invoice and be reimbursed for those. Um, as an aside, we followed up with our leadership in the, our payments division, and she has indicated that she has not received any um, inquiries or complaints from our provider community indicating that there's any issues regarding cash flow or requests for funds. And so, um, have any presented, how many have presented invoices? How many of the contracts? We get contracts on a regular basis. Last year, DYCC is over 28,000 invoice, um, invoices. I mean, invoices it, on a regular basis. Chair, it would be hard because they're because we're allowing them to expense off their base contract, it would be hard to know if this Correct. was a learning lab until that's all comes com gets rectified. Yep, I get it. Thank you so much. And so when you talked about there are a number that are in the controller's office, that would be of the ones, I'm gonna do quick math, 120, 50, there are roughly 50 that are um, new contracts, right? So- that's, Yes, that's correct. Okay. There, are, there are roughly 50 new providers that have been introduced to the DYC um, portfolio that will have to get registered. And, and you, so you said some of them are already in the controller's office waiting for that final registration or? Of the 40, I, I don't wanna say that they're necessarily the new CBOs, but there are a number of actions that are currently, um, have moved along in the process and are closer to registration. Have any of those been able to submit invoices? Are you asking regarding the new providers? As of right now, there has been no um, new providers that have been registered. So as of right now, they are un unable to submit an invoice and be reimbursed. Okay. I wanna be able to reiterate that our ACO has been working very closely with them and MOX um, 
to try to get the loan going. So we are doing everything possible to try to make sure um, that that subset of our um, contractors are trying to get the assistance that's needed. Great, 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 great. Yep, so that you're setting them up so that as soon as they're registered, they can get a, a loan from the returnable grant fund. That is correct. Okay, and you're, you're confirmed that there's enough money in the returnable grant fund to I, I can't speak to that that's that's the mocks would have to speak to that but what what I am confirming is that we are doing our due diligence in directing providers who don't have access to cash flow um to the loan fund and we're working very closely with them and it is our hope that many of them will get through yeah I only ask because um again if this is a hurdle in some way for new providers. It's, it's just interesting um, to think about as we try to expand it to so many more. Um, Understood. It's on Mott's radar. And again, I, I can't, um, I think Susan has said it um, tremendously throughout this hearing, but we have been working very well with many of our partners and many of the different agencies. And whether it's Mox, DOE, everyone has stepped up to the plate and understand the, the severity of um, you know, this initiative. So um, that's so, so helpful. Last question, just about um, health and safety. Um, uh, Deputy Chancellor Wallach mentioned that a just very few number of the sites have um, incurred anyone with COVID. Do you have roughly a percentage or some sort of data around how many sites have um, experienced a case with COVID? I don't want to give you information and have to walk it back, but I'll say very anecdotally, and I do, I'm, I am looking at that regularly. We hadn't, as of Friday, had any learning lab site closures at all. Um, for the K-8, to actually, that was true for the early childhood as well. Um, we definitely had some reports of either a symptomatic child or a COVID tested positive child or staff person. In those cases, the person would be staying home to quarantine. And if they uh, had close contact with another person in the program, those uh, people would also get a letter to say, um, I'm sorry, if the case was confirmed also to quarantine. So there's definitely been a little bit of uh, reporting going on that we are staying on top of, working closely with our partners, Test and Trace, Department of Health, telling us exactly, you know, how, when was the contagious period, and here's the specific action steps to take with, um, with providers. So it's been, I think it's been relatively low, um, but, but yes, yeah, certainly there have been cases. Thank you so much. That's it for me, Chair Rose. Thank you so much to the administration. I really want to express uh, you know, gratitude to you all. I know how hard you're working on behalf of our city's kids. So, you know, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Rose, you need to be unmuted. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal, for your thoughtful and insightful questions. Um, I just have a, a few more and um, then we'll, we'll let you go. I, I know it's been a long day. Um, I, I was just wondering um, in terms of safety, what are the, um, are the protocols, you know, um, have the protocols for cleaning and disinfecting um, for the childcare providers and, um, and how how were they made aware of what those protocols are? And um, are they expected to cover the extra costs for regular deep cleaning and disinfecting? And how are you monitoring and enforcing these protocols? Okay, I'm gonna turn to my colleague, Wanda Asheril to talk a little bit about the monitoring and Josh may wanna weigh in yep. as well. I'll say that the um, contract for learning labs includes the costs for OTPS, which would include your cleaning and disinfecting and your 
PPE. And uh, going back to the summer, um, Department of Health has been very clear. These are the guidelines for cleaning and disinfecting. It's um, it, it's uh, not rock and science, but it's essential that programs adhere to this. So we are reiterating it regularly. Um, it's part of our core guide for providers, hand hygiene, um, respiration hygiene, keeping your, keeping your masks on, cleaning first, and then disinfecting all the commonly used areas in the program. Um, that's, you know, becoming part of the day-to-day -day protocol that they're used to, and we're, we keep offering them supports about how to do that. Um, we also have some monitoring efforts in place. Um, Wanda, do you want to talk a little bit about that? And maybe um, DOE wants to share some of their efforts as well. Sure. Um, good afternoon, Chair Rose and Chair Rosenthal. Um, as Susan mentioned, um, in partnership with the Division of Early Childhood Education, um, the Office of Health um, will be providing, in addition to our, our, our messaging to our providers, um, they're providing nursing support during um, uh, over this, the course of this year. Um, and then support includes call-ins, um, call-ins, in-person support to ensure that all programs have appropriate process and practices in place and to respond to program specific needs. Um, they will also be available to guide program with their health and safety practices. Any questions that they may have about COVID-19 symptoms um, and also the setup of the isolation rooms and the use of PPEs. Um, and then these nurses are gonna be visiting programs over um, at least once every four to six weeks. Um, and then in addition to these support services from these experts, um, DYCD to what Susan was um, mentioning is also conducting in-person visits over the next couple of weeks. Um, and we're gonna be utilizing our own evaluation tool that is designed to provide additional support, um, especially as they're navigating contracts and, and, and attendance tracking. Um, and it's also designed to provide uh, coaching and to observe program design and all around safety practices, overall quality of services. And then there are three uh, main areas that we're looking at, administration, um, so anything around paperwork, attendance tracking, program practices, you know, what do they have in place to ensure safety, what is their program design, and then just overall uh, service quality. And then lastly, over, we anticipate over the next couple of days um, to have a series of both internal uh, and external communication on the evaluation tool so that everyone kind of knows what to expect, is prepared, and we can act and answer any of their of their questions as we conduct our visits um, in person over the next couple of weeks. Is there a testing component? Are um, are are tests available um, at these sites uh, for for the students that are participating and possibly their family members? <clears throat> Um, can you clarify what do you mean by testing? Um, testing uh, COVID, you know, oh. um, testing and tracing. Um, is there any um, component uh, that's available? To all, the yeah, all CBS. I'm sorry, Chair Rose. Hmm? I'm, sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was going to say all, all the community-based organizations providing Learning Labs programs were given priority access through city-run testing sites for expedited results, and that was before programs began, but it continues now. So all the provider staff and are, are informed. Providers are making sure that families know either when somebody's symptomatic or just as preventative measures. Here are the places you go. It's in our guide. Here's where you can access free testing. Um, it's not part of the on-site programming for the most part. There may be some exceptions where providers are doing that on-site, but it is available to, to all the programs. Yes, and to add to that, some of our, to, to what Susan was just saying, some of our providers um, have partnered with like local clinics and they've created like a community um, free testing um, day. So they work, you know, they're, they're leveraging their resources and their partners within their community. Um, and are we doing anything to support the mental health needs of, of the children and, um, and their families um, in the learning lab programs? Yeah, I want to say, like, I, I think, and I know um, DOE will, will have something to say about this too, because I know for both agencies, like the past few years, there's been a tremendous focus on social emotional learning 
and providing trauma-informed support for families. And we're aware, obviously, this is an incredibly stressful time for everybody, especially for young people. Some of them are really grieving. But in any case, they've lost a lot of the social networks that are part of basic human development, child development, youth development. Um, and so I feel like positive that we had laid the groundwork through mental for health first aid trainings, through um, trauma-informed practices, uh, series of, uh, of capacity building trainings that we've offered to, to staff in programs. On top of that, we've got all the resources of Thrive, texting and calling NYC well for your specific questions. Uh, their website has great resources about how to talk to young people about what's going on with an emphasis on safety, how to um, engage young people and identify signs where, where somebody's really you know, we're all struggling, but struggling in a way that might need some extra support. So I feel we, I feel we had a great foundation before the pandemic, and now we have a lot of concrete resources that we're sharing. I know um, DOE has uh, similar supports for providers. Yeah, it's been a big focus for for us in the in the school system over the last couple of years, and then as we entered this fall um, um, through our our division of school climate and wellness. Um, we made sure that all of uh, all the staff in our school buildings um, and all of the um, the team in the in the division of early childhood um, got some additional support so that we could be equipped to provide tra trauma informed care and uh, mental health support um, in the context of what we do with families every day. Just understanding, um, um, uh, trying to be sympathetic to and attentive to the experiences that they've undergone during this pandemic and uh, and provide appropriate support to them. Um, we're also thinking hard about how our nurses can supplement that as well as we begin to integrate them more and more into the program. So um, it's a it's a big focus of ours as well. So when um, when the nurses visit, um, do they actually get a, the opportunity to, to sit and speak with the young people to to make some type of a assessment um, of of what maybe their the mental health needs might be. Um, you're, you're, you're saying that there's an in-service kind of training for, um, for our providers to maybe recognize trauma-induced um, behaviors or something that our young people might be experiencing. You know, um, I, I just want to know if, if it's a part of the sort of a, a regular part of the, the programming and, and what we look for in terms of, of, of needs for the, the young people who are in learning labs. Is, is that I'll, a, a I'll, component? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just say on the early childhood side, um, I'll just start. Um, it, it is, um, and it really has been part of the foundation of 3K and pre-K work from the beginning. And we have a team of social workers that's deployed to sites to help build that capacity in our community-based partners. And I think we just accelerated and built on that um, as we entered the pandemic and just made sure that all of our teams were trained on the fundamentals of trauma-informed care so that we could respond appropriately. So that's what we've done on the sort of preschool side. Um, I think the school age side, just again, just sticking with Department of Education, I think all the students in Learning Bridges are also attending DOE schools where those teams were also trained in trauma-informed care as we approach this school year. Um, um, and so and those kids are getting support um, from their school-based teams, in addition to the work that we're doing with, with providers of learning bridges. Okay. Well, um, I, I wanna thank you. Um, I, I really would like to thank you all um, from the administration. For, for what you're doing. I know that these are very challenging times. They, um, they are challenging for you as administrators, but they're also very challenging for our families who have to try to ensure that their children are getting the best quality education that they can while being able to uh, take care of their families because they're essential workers and they, they have to they have to support these families economically. And so I, I, I wanna thank you for, you know, working as hard as you are, as diligently and as expeditiously as you are to fill these slots. 
Um, I still have a concern about those who are not, who have not gotten placement. Um, you know, I, I don't want this to become an issue of educational neglect where our children are, are not getting um, what they are, they are rightfully entitled to. So um, I am willing to do all that we can to help you get all of the sites that you need to accommodate the total needs. Um, and that we really have to do a better job of, of, of addressing the needs of our young people who have IEPs who, who need you know, more supportive services in order for um, us to meet the mandates of their IEPs. And so um, with that, I, again, I say that whatever we can do, I can do to help expedite these um, situations, please let me know. Um, and, and I thank you. Uh, I think you've, um, I, I know that you're all working as hard as you can to, to mitigate any of the, the obstacles that we're, we have. And so um, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to thank you. Just, I'd, I'd just like to thank you. So um, I will now turn the committee um, back to um, our moderator to call on members of the public to testify. And before we excuse the administration, apologies. I think Chair Rosenthal also had another question. Oh, oh, thank I'm you so sorry. much, Chair Rose. Sorry. It's like the hearing that it's like Groundhog Day, just never ends. But um, I just want to triple check with you that if our schools close, you will remain open and that any child who is currently enrolled in a DOE school will have access to and 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 who maybe is already signed up with right with will continue with their learning lab and learning bridges program how about kids okay so how okay so for kids who are not enrolled currently and if schools were to close they will not have i just want to say it out loud they will not have access to a learning lab or learning bridge program. Um, but you will continue to make sites available up on your website. What I'm thinking about is let's say there's a kid who did not opt for blended learning, but opted for on site every, oh, can you do that? Well, if there was a school, maybe a D75 school, maybe the question is mm -hmm. if D, Will D75 schools remain open as learning lab sites if the rest of the schools close down? Well, let me, let me start with this. Yes, Learning Bridges programs will remain open even if schools are shut down. Yes, all currently enrolled students who are DOE students enrolled in blended learning will continue to be served at Learning Bridges programs. In some, yes, we will continue to open new sites and add eligible applicant families to those sites to the extent that they still have capacity even after offering possibly additional days to the currently enrolled students. Um, and yes, we want to continue accept applications from people. Uh, sticking with the eligibility of DOE enrolled students who, who had opted into blended learning so incredibly helpful but can you answer the question about the d75 schools yeah. i don't know that i don't know if josh has that information your your question is would they remain open if the if 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 the citywide positivity went above three percent um i i wanted i want to triple check but my understanding is that um the entire system would would close um and um so i um that's my understanding. So we would be in a situation where those kids, if they weren't already in, enrolled in Learning Bridges, you know, um, uh, would we would have to we would have to talk with those families. But um, let me triple check that, and I'll get back to you. But that's my understanding. And you know, and it's uh, there's no good answer in this situation, right? I mean, in this is a tough thing, no one's gone through it. Do we want the D75 schools to stay open? There are reasons to do that. 
do we want them to close our reasons to do that? But I guess my question is, would DOE, um, just, just if you could confirm for me that yeah. you will make real consideration about these 75 schools sort of separately, uh, independent from the rest of the school system. Can you say that again? I'm sorry, I just missed part of that. Just that, um, sorry, there were other people here. Oh, yeah. Um, just that uh, you'll take into consideration the unique needs of D75 kids and parents as you think oh. of closing the school system. Absolutely, absolutely. No question about it. Great, thank you. And for uh, sites that are not schools, are they indemnified if anything should happen on their site? In other words, do they automatically, through the contract, carry the city's indemnification should something happen? I'm going to get back to you about that, about the specific detail in the contracts with our legal department. We can get back to you. I'm not sure about that. I don't know about DOE. Same. I have to check. Okay, um, so what I'm hearing from a, that question comes from a provider. So they're concerned that if the school is closed and their site remains open, um, that the city has not made it so they're indemnified. So, so particularly should the schools close, I, I hope you can resolve that situation and not leave the providers out on a limb. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Got it. And and we, you know, Commissioner Chong, DYCD, my colleagues here, we really want to thank you guys for your support as well. This has definitely been like a full team effort. And I know in particular, Chair Rose, um, you know, pushing us, asking, questioning us, letting us know where their concerns across the community along the way. Um, and if I may, the silver lining of this dark, dark period has been getting to know some of my fabulous colleagues that we haven't connected with before and just seeing that the DOE team, the, the, the DYCD team and our other agency partners um, doubling down, tripling down, working so hard to help meet the needs of families. Um, no one complaining, even though I'm sure we're all exhausted and struggling with the same, some of the same issues you've highlighted here today. Um, and I just want to take the opportunity to say, you know, on the record, how much I appreciate working with my colleagues and how I'm, I am impressed I am. And we're on, we're, you know, we're grateful to be in these jobs and, and have the opportunity to serve the city. And that is one silver lining in this experience. No, it's really great that you said that. Um, terrific. Uh, I just, uh, we're only going to have one more panel. And it, that's going to have some parents and some providers on it. I would hope the city could find uh, at least one person to stay on this Zoom, uh, just to make sure you know we know you're hearing their concerns. Um, that'd be really great. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, <laughs> Chair um, Rosenthal. Um, and yes. Please, if, if admin could st stay, we, we really would like you to stay. It's only um, three panelists um, and they only have three minutes each. So uh, please stay. Um, okay, so now I'm going to turn it back to the moderator um, so that she can call on the members of the public to testify. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Rose um, and Chair Rosenthal. Uh, Chair Rose, we now have four members um, of the next panel that are logged in. One more person joined us. So we will have one panel today with four individuals. Uh, we will name all those individuals, but first I just wanna go over some housekeeping items and some reminders. For public testimony, I'll call up individuals in panels, so the one panel. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist, please use the raised hand function in Zoom. You'll be called on after everyone in the panel has completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking um, after they set the timer. And um, there is a, a slight delay in unmuting you and you will get a box to accept the unmute. So please uh, click the unmute button when you see that. 
All public testimony will be limited to a three minute clock. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before you start your testimony. So the panelists today, there will be one panel and I will list your names in order and then um, call the first panelist. It will be Faith Behum and apologies for any pronunciation errors again. Uh, Greg Gregory Brender from United Neighborhood Houses, David Gaskin from Seaman Society for Children and Families, and finally Felicia Sudin or Sudin or Sudin. So we will start with panelist one, Faith Behum. You may begin your testimony once the sergeant calls the clock. You may begin now. Thank you, Chairpersons Rose and Rosenthal, for the opportunity to present testimony at this hearing today. My name is Faith Bam, and I am an advocacy and policy advisor at UJA Federation of New York. Ten of UJA's nonprofit partners oversee Learning Labs, providing services and supports to children and youth in all five New York City boroughs. I'm going to outline a sampling of the issues UJA's nonprofit partners have experienced overseeing the Learning Labs, and will submit my entire testimony. First, there have been a number of issues with kosher food and learning labs. Providers must invest a significant amount of time traveling to and from the DOE grab and go sites that supply kosher food. UJA agencies have rep reported experiencing issues with the grab and go program, including with the meal quality, many report a lack of variety and unappealing cold meals, food being an in inappropriate to meet the nutritional needs of the children and youth, for example, meals consisting solely of carrots and hummus, and an insufficient number of meals available for participants in their programs. All of these issues could be resolved if our providers are compensated to provide these meals within their own agencies using their own kosher caterers. Second, UJA agencies saw the Learning Lab initiative as an opportunity to support children and youth, including those with disabilities, as they navigate remote learning and provide a safe place for families to leave their children as they return to work. When learning labs were first announced, students with disabilities were one of the groups indicated as being prioritized to benefit from the program. Unfortunately, UGA's network of nonprofit partners have struggled to serve individuals with disabilities through the learning lab programs. DYCD did mention when they are testifying earlier today that families will be given more of a say in which learning lab their child can attend. And this will positively impact children and youth with disabilities, allowing them to choose learning lab placements and organizations that are closer to their homes and in programs they are familiar with. What still remains a problem is that programs that do have individuals with disabilities in their learning labs are finding it incredibly difficult to support these participants appropriately. Many of these individuals require one-on-one -on -one supports when they attend school and also require this when they're engaging in remote learning. Learning Lab contracts offer no additional financial assistance for programs to provide these supports. UJA urges DYCD to increase the per participant rate for Learning Lab providers who have students with disabilities enrolled in their programs. And quickly, some things I want to highlight. Guidance that is given to providers, especially when it's address addressing school closures, is often reactionary and leaves many Learning Lab providers with more questions than answers. Comprehensive background checks being completed in a timely manner are impacting Learning Lab providers' ability to staff their programs. Providers have no say in how many schools they are matched with, ca causing these programs to be overwhelmed by the various school schedules they need to build Learning Lab services around. And providers still have nothing in writing. Your time is up. Sorry. <laughs> um, have nothing in writing from DYCD that will be compensated for the full amount of their contract. And many providers continue to wait to be compensated for learning lab services they have already overseen. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Um, I, I'd like to hear the rest of your comments. Um, are they, can you wrap it up in a few min seconds? Oh, that was it. Yeah, I actually did. Yeah, the last thing was the, the being compensated the full amount of their contract. We just want to have something in writing from DYCD saying that that's going to happen. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next witness will be Gregory Brender from United Neighborhood Houses. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, um, if chairs or if council members could please use the raise hand function if you have questions um, and that written testimony will also be accepted up to 72 hours after the hearing. Thank you. Mr. Brender. 
Thank you. And uh, thank you, Chair Rose and Chair Rosenthal. And I also see that, oh, I also see that several members of the uh, administration and DYCD and DOE have stayed on in, in uh, response to Chair Rose's request. So thank you for that. Um, I'm Gregory Brender from United Neighborhood Houses. We are a policy and social change organization of New York City Settlement Houses. Um, I've submitted um, longer written testimony, but I wanna run through our recommendations around learning labs and also just emphasize that learning labs are one of the many ways in which CBOs have been called on in an even greater degree uh, to respond to this crisis, particularly for children and youth. Uh, the first thing is, I think we need to recognize that in keeping learning labs open uh, during any school shutdown, that that requires the staff of these community-based organizations to risk their own health and safety, to keep providing emergency child care for New York City to continue to offer this service. Uh, these are staff who are generally paid lower than similar staff in public schools, and in order to uh, they deserve to receive incentive pay uh, because of the risks they are taking in order to provide an emergency child care system for New York City's families. Uh, the other key recommendations, uh, we urge that there's clear communication with learning lab providers if New York City faces a system-wide school building shutdown, um, that we need to ensure that funding remains consistent. This was something I know that was addressed in the hearings, but we need to keep the understanding up that as an emergency system, this is not something you wanna base on the number of children participating. You need to base it on that this is a system there for when parents desperately need childcare because of the, their role in uh, as essential workers during the pandemic. Um, we want to have DYCD um, and DOE provide uh, greater flexibility around scheduling, uh, particularly um, because providers are receiving rosters that don't have information about when the children are in their hybrid school in-person days. Um, we want to make sure that they have flexibility to maintain schedules and then particularly to make sure that they have appropriate numbers of children in so that they do not go over any um, minimums or maximums for classroom sizes. Um, Finally, and then this is, or not finally, this is something that was discussed in the hearing, um, but as noted, many of the providers are after school providers. They already have relationships with many of the families. And in some cases you have the case where the kids are actually leaving the learning labs to go home to participate in remote after school. We want to find ways to make sure that there's a seamless transition so that you actually have something providing 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, the full day of care that youth development programs have been working with schools to provide um, for all these years um, as part of a youth development framework. Um, we want to ensure that there are additional resources available to staff learning labs um, if they need to expand and this in particular if there's a school shutdown and you're now serving the same number of children but for a larger number of days you need to increase the number of staffs and increase the number of the amount of space available uh, so that they can keep children in separate classrooms and maintain the pod model. Your time is uh, up. Thanks. Oh, go ahead. Uh, then the other two, um, I just wanted to reiterate the backlog of comprehensive background checks is a major issue. Um, and it's particularly an issue for learning lab providers because the solution that came to this issue from the state was to allow um, supervised clearances where an already cleared staff member would be supervising new staff members. But because learning labs are sometimes opening new sites, they can't avail themselves of that because they don't necessarily have a cleared staff member on that site. So it is really important, um, if, particularly if we're gonna see an expansion of this program, uh, that we clear the backlog of comprehensive background checks. We make sure that these important checks, which we fully support happening, they are checking for very important things around who we want uh, to have access to children, that, they're, that that system works smoothly and actually gets checks back to providers in a timely manner. And thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and we will move to the next panelist, is, uh, which will be David Gaskin from the Seaman Society for Children and Families. Mr. Gaskin. Thank you very much. Um, Your time will begin now. Thank you very much. Um, my name is David Gaskin. I'm the president and CEO of Seaman Society for Children and Families. And um, before I make my remarks, I just wanted to say this is a very critical conversation. And I wanted to um, thank Chair Rose, uh, Chair Rosenthal, uh, Commissioner Haskell, uh, Deputy Chancellor Wallach and um, Associate Commissioner um, Rattray uh, for the discussion today. Um, uh, I'm here really to support the testimony of uh, Nellie Suarez, our director of our family daycare program, um, who hopefully we can unmute her as well. 
and um, Felicia Sudin, um, the vice president of the programs. Seaman Society um, has been fortunate to serve um, uh, New York City um, families since our founding on Staten Island in 1846. Um, since our beginnings 174 years ago, Siemens has been a place of comfort and resilience for vulnerable children and families, especially during times of uncertainty, including the last pandemic in 1918. Um, we are well positioned, as you'll hear from Felicia and, and um, <coughs> early today um, to provide the learning lab services. Uh, we've actually been a daycare provider for the past 40 years and we've been very successful at it. During the pandemic, we have been the only provider of emergency childcare services to Staten Island families of first responders and we're very proud of that. Um, I think the biggest takeaway um, from the discussion uh, that Felicia and um, Nellie will share in terms of our experience with the learning labs initiative is really that we are well positioned. Um, we have the capacity, the staff, um, the safe space. We actually literally call it a learning lab. Um, we, and we have the high quality level of experience and connection to the community on Staten Island um, to responsibly and safely serve the children um, in the learning labs. Um, we also have wraparound services that can support the children as well. So I just wanted just to, to share my thoughts today. Um, appreciate the time um, for our testimonial. And if you can um, unmute, unmute um, Nelly um, Suarez and then Felicia Sudin, um, they'll continue our testimony. Okay, so we're gonna uh, switch our order, uh, chairs, if this is okay. Um, so we, the, or the order had been Faith um, Gregory, Faith Bayhoom, Gregory Bender, David Gaskin, Felicia Student, and now Nelly Suarez, Suarez, excuse my pronunciation. So we will now go to uh, Felicia Student and Nelly Suarez. Um, and then, yes, that's correct. The host will unmute you. And when the sergeant calls the clock, you may begin. The time will begin. Sorry, my name is Felicia Sudin and I'm the Vice President um, at Senior Society for Children and Families. I oversee the prevention program, which works on children who are at imminent risk for placement into foster care. Um, I also oversee the domestic violence program and the family daycare program. Um, Today I'm here to provide testimony um, that we should be able to provide childcare services under the Learning Bridges program to children in the community. We've been serving Staten Island in childcare services for over 40 years. We worked during the entire pandemic um, providing early education services to the children in need. Um, if there's anyone who knows this community who is ready and willing to be able to provide services, it is us. Um, is everyone hearing the same background? One second. Now we can't hear you at all. Sorry, I unmuted because it was echoing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to Nelly because we'll both be echoing because we're in the same area. Uh -huh. <laughs> Your time will begin. Good afternoon, I'm Nellie Suarez. And for the past 34 years, I've worked as a director of the Family Daycare Network at Seaman Society for Children and Families. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Chair Rose and Chair Rosenthal for the opportunity to testify at this hearing. Um, as Felicia mentioned, uh, we've been providing childcare services to Staten Island for the past 40 years. Uh, we served approximately 200 children who were cared for by 21 licensed providers. Our program uh, followed a published curriculum to prepare children for kindergarten. Our family daycare program in all, in all its history has never been on corrective action or heightened monitoring. Siemens Vendor score in the passport system has always met or exceeded our expectations. Um, I'd like to move on now to the learning lab and provide a breakdown um, of the sequence of events that actually led us to this hearing. On July 21st, 
Siemens applied for the Learning Bridges program to provide childcare services for children when school is out of session. On September 15th, we were informed by DYCD that a 100 slot contract will be awarded to us. On September 16th, Felicia Sudin, Vice President of the Program, and myself were part of a remote, remote interview led by, led by DYCD Director Paula Calby. On September 21st, Siemens was notified that the contract would begin on October 5th. On October 7th, Siemens was informed by DYCD that they were unable to award us 100 slots. To date, we have no details as to why this decision was made. You know, I just want to point out that there is a still an overwhelming need for childcare on Staten Island. Parents need to work. There are public schools, particularly in the St. George area, that have not yet been matched with the Learning Bridges program. Parents are frustrated and still waiting to be contacted about their child's enrollment in the Learn Learning Bridges program. I would like to close by stating that Siemens Society for Children and Families was and still is prepared to meet that need. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rose. Thank you. Thank you um, to all of the panelists. Um, I, you know, I've been informed that DYCD holds weekly calls for um, providers and coalition members. Um, have the panelists uh, communicated these concerns with DYCD and, and what was the outcome? Uh, go ahead, Felicia. I, I, I was just, I, I was asked to unmute, but uh, we have, we yeah. have communicated our concerns and go, go ahead, Felicia. Um, I was going to say, yes, we have communicated our concerns to DYCD. We reached out to them um, advocating for the need for the community services. We asked for an additional opportunity so that we can provide services given the need to the community and we have not heard a response yet. Okay. Um, and uh, were you at least um, told that there would be some follow-up, that there's a, an appeal process or anything? No. Well, we addressed that on this hearing today, and, um, and there will be some follow-up at least to, um, to have a follow-up conversation with you um, regarding this issue. Um, I was wondering if from um, Faith and Gregory, um, if you have had any uh, conversations with DYCD, um, either on their weekly calls or by any other source of communication about what your concerns are and, um, and has there been any um, follow-up or, um, or what was their response to, to your, the concerns that were presented? Uh, we have raised uh, about, um, we have raised these concerns with DYCD as well as with um, other agencies. I know that some of them go beyond DYCD and that there are uh, particularly with, for example, the background checks issues we need to deal with with the health department, um, as well as also a lot of the decisions coming down um, both from DYCD and DOE, particularly around um, allowing um, students from outside the uh, initial feeder schools into the learning labs. Yes, and I, as far as our providers, um, specifically about the kosher food issue, um, I know a number of them have uh, talked to DYCD and DOE because there is a number of issues with um, getting spoiled and just not fresh food in the beginning. And that has since improved, but um, as far as like the location of the grab and go sites, um, it's just a very time consuming process and the meals still just quite honestly aren't great. Um, so our providers have really been asking if they could be compensated for using their own kosher caterers, their own in-house caterers that they actually use to feed the kids in their UPK programs. Um, but so far it's been a hard no um, from DYCD. And as far as the students with disabilities issue um, are a number of our providers, especially the ones who are really just wanna serve kids um, with a, who are experiencing a number of challenges. We have one program that have kids with 
autism, Down syndrome, and even physical disabilities. And this program is like, we cannot properly serve these kids if we don't have a, an additional person helping them one-on-one. -on -one. And they have reached out to DYCD, um, just really advocating for the increase of rates so that they could actually hire more people to help those kids. Um, but so far there has not been any response on that end, on DYCD's end. Okay. And, and if I could just add, uh, Chair Rose, um, to my uh, earlier comments, you know, we, we, it's, it's hard to overstate that the Siemens Society has a sterling record of service as it relates to child care services on Staten Island. Um, um, we have a sterling record and uh, we know that there's increasing demand and certainly as the pandemic wears on, um, families are going to need support. And as we saw today in the discussion, you know, there's a uh, you know, um, demand is exceeding capacity right now by about 6,000 um, um, children. So uh, that being said, I, I think we have a, a very strong um, record of service um, upon which we are ready and willing and able to, uh, to serve. Thank you. Um, yes, I don't think that there's any question about the quality of the service that uh, Siemens Society has has delivered for the residents of Staten Island. Um, and so um, I, I again implore that you, you follow up and, and speak to them about the appeal process um, to see, especially since we're in need of more seats, more slots. So um, uh, I'll, I will be following up with DYCD also to find out um, whether or not you've at least been given the opportunity to find out uh, what criteria you were um, based, it was based on, and um, and if there's some other steps that could be taken. Um, I, I want to uh, say to um, the other panelists that um, in, in terms of of communication, I, I asked DYCD uh, to have an a, an official left, you know, to stay on so that um, they could hear these concerns and, um, and follow up. So I will follow up with DYCD to, um, to ensure that, you know, your concerns have been heard and that there is a response to, um, to each of these uh, concerns. Um, and I just wanted to ask in terms of enrollment and capacity, um, Gregory, I, I know you um, represent UNH, um, which is our series of providers, and um, and I know uh, UJA is on 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 this panel. Um, do you feel that you have um, uh, your ability to um, provide the capacity has been met? Um, or that you you can accept more slots, more young people um, to your programming um, in light of the fact that we still have a need that hasn't been met. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to determine capacity. Do you feel like you have capacity to enroll additional youngsters or is, is that not an issue for you? I think it's, and this is probably going to be a frustrating answer. I think it really differs neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, in most, um, most of the folks we've been talking to, there is um, some under enrollment, as you've seen in the numbers citywide. Uh, whether there'd be enough capacity for sort of a doubling of the system if it's moving towards five days a week during. Um, and a situation with the school shutdown, I think is a larger question and would probably need a more significant investment to get there. Okay. Um, and my last question is, um, do you feel that there's been enough transparency and the communication has been um, at a level that's been responsive to the needs of, of the providers? I think there's a lead for a, a lot better communication. I don't know if I get in some trouble for saying this, but sometimes we're learning things from the Twitter feeds of education reporters, um, because you know, yes, as are you. Um, 
and including from council members. Uh, so there's definitely a need to increase communication, particularly I think when it comes to decisions around school closure um, and the kind of changes, you know, even when the when Learning Labs was first proposed, um, a lot of folks, uh, when they learned about it because um, it was a mayoral press conference and there really should be more direct communication with providers that's really gets down to brass tacks of what's being asked. And when the answers aren't there, there should be more of an effort to bring providers to the table to help the to help providers help the city shape what these programs will be. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair Rosenthal. Chair Rosenthal. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all um, <clears throat> who testified just now. Really appreciate your insights. That's how we can uh, do anything is by learning from you. So I really appreciate that. Just a couple of quick follow-up questions to Council Member Rose's uh, questions. Um, I'm wondering, uh, particularly for UNH and UJA, uh, again, on the demand for seats compared to the number of seats, I'm wondering if your providers keep wait lists. So for learning labs, uh, we don't have that option because uh, we receive the roster, or providers receive the rosters from the city. Um, for most after school programs, they do keep wait lists. Um, and generally they do know the families because most learning labs are being run by um, after school providers. They do know the families who they have connections with and who, have been, who they have been serving in that way. But I, for learning labs formally, I don't think we can have a wait list. Right, that makes sense because um, you wouldn't know hypothetically who applied um, right. do your point about um, the wait list on after schools could be a great proxy for that. Um, so that'd be interesting if you can find that out. Uh, I think that'd be a great proxy to hear about. And um, yeah, so thank you. Um, any other thoughts on that? One thing that we have heard that I, um, you know, is that providers are hearing from the families who they have connections with, who they have been serving in their after school programs, particularly in the situation like uh, I think Chair Rose mentioned, where they were the feeder school of a learning lab was uh, on the other side of Staten Island. In situations like that, where the connection between the CBO and the feeder school has some geographic distance between it, a lot of times providers are actually hearing from the families in their immediate neighborhood who traditionally they have been serving through after school or even if they're, you know, grandmas in the senior center. Even especially like students with disabilities, just because a lot of the, the, you know, they get used to the programs that they have attended in the past and the staff. Um, and so a lot of the people in our network have been saying that some of those kids have been, um, a, they have been matched to a learning lab that isn't at a UJA program where they're used to going for after school or whatever. Um, and in some instances, uh, there are some people who are matched to a different learning lab while they're also matched to an after school program at a UJA provider. But because of where the learning lab is in, in location to where the uh, UJA provider is, they can't get to either the after school program from the learning lab because of the lack of transportation. So it's a missed opportunity because this is like this individual individual child, for instance, could have had like 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. care, but because they were matched in that different learning lab, that, that option is off the table for them. And, and why do you think they were matched at that other location? Is it because that provider was willing to take kids uh, with special needs despite not being paid for it? I don't think so. I mean, a lot of it is just 
how the DOE determined which uh, kids should go to which learning labs. And so there really just has not been a say either by the providers or from the individuals, the families themselves who are sending these kids to these programs. So I did, I was heartened to hear that DYCD, I guess they are looking at giving more family choice in the future, which would I think help this problem. I think the other reason why DOE was doing this though was to keep the cohorts, like to try to have some control over um, keeping cohorts stagnant from certain schools. But there's just, uh, you know, in the beginning, there were some schools that were across the street from some of our programs that they weren't matched to the learning lab that was across the street from the school that they usually serve. So um, there is just a lot of issues like that with how the schools were matched to the learning labs. And I think a lot of that is because the, um, the they just, they weren't connected in a way that was thoughtful. I mean, it, your answer implies that there are providers out there with uh, the capability of serving kids with disabilities and mm -hmm. who have agreed to contracts that don't pay them for right. those services, um, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, and and you think that your kids who who need supports are getting those supports, albeit at a different site, or they're just choosing not to participate in the program because they're not familiar with the people who are serving them in that different program. And in some instances, it's a distance issue where the family is just like, we can't get the child to that program in order for me to get to work on time or whatever. Right, 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 right. I mean, it strikes me that after this hearing, after what we learned today, it would be worth sending a note to all your um, participants saying reapply or, you know, or submit a, um, um, you know, request for change. Yeah. Um, at this juncture, and I'd be really curious to know two weeks from now or three weeks from now whether or not they've gotten a reply. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that does sound just so strange. Um, another sort of follow up question to Councilmember Rose's question about food. Um, Faith, do you, did you hear? I didn't quite get the number. When they were saying how many kosher meals they were providing, did they say 400 meals a day? I couldn't quite hear it. It was something with four. I'm sorry. I can't, I can't, I know. Same. Same. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I heard your comments loud and clear. Um, so again, even for that situation, what we learned today is I heard the city say that you, uh, um, a nonprofit could, a provider could um, go back and say the halal meals aren't working out, we're going to contract with our own provider, and they would be open to that. I guess what they said was, sure, we're open to that, we're just not going to give you any more money if it costs. Right. And therein lies the problem, yeah, yeah. Because I, I mentioned this before, like our, our pre-K programs, um, they serve kosher food through their kitchens to those programs. Um, so it, it happens through different city contracts um, or like the senior centers and, you know, the same thing. They, they are serving meals through those other city contracts. So this isn't something that's totally novel and hasn't been done before. Um, it just requires the that. Question, yeah, the question there, I apologize for interrupting. It's okay. <laughs> I'm so excited by what you said. <laughs> But then the question is, on those other programs for seniors or pre-K, whatever, do the city contract, does the city's contract uh, include full payment for those meals? I believe they do, yes. Really? Um, yeah, I, I know like our UPK providers are saying that in particular because they're just, it's funny at these- at the bump. Uh, yeah, at the JCCs, for instance, they're saying, you know, how their four-year-olds get these nice, warm little meals of like soup and like a nice little side and like the learning lab kids are getting these just cold tuna salad, egg salad, 
hummus and carrots, <laughs> you know? So, um, and, and there's some days where our providers are like, I cannot serve this to our children and they'll buy cheap pizza or they'll try to cater it through their own kitchens. But again, they're not getting compensated on those days if they make those decisions to do that. Um, It'd be interesting. And is 400 or whatever the number is, do you think, um, yeah, that's right. I, it might be worth doing the math and yeah. finding out the difference. And then, you know, we could make a special plea for that. Although we won't be capturing all sites, um, but it might be interesting. And the other question that we didn't follow up with, but I wonder about, it. they did not say whether or not they're providing halal meals. Um, right. and I, I wonder for students who require a halal meal, whether or not that is open to them. Yeah. My guess is they end up with a, a bad kosher meal. I mean, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask Faith for you and for Gregory, do, your providers, um, I think maybe you already answered this, but do your providers who are equipped with the supports or the para, um, paras um, have any, do you have any placements of those kids from DOE? So we have, um, the thing is, is that we, like one of our agencies in particular, I've been talking to a lot about this, who need the extra one-on-one. -on -one. Um, they could bring the one-on-ones in. Um, so they've had kids who are placed with them who have this need for the one-on-one -on -one support. It's just, they just don't have the money to pay those paraprofessionals to be there to help them do the one-on-one -on -one support when they're doing the remote learning. Got it. And so the organization makes the decision, maybe kid by kid. Right. So this yeah. specific organization has reached out to DYCD and said, like, look, we have the ability. We actually have the staff here who could do this, but we, we have to be paid for these extra people who are helping out. Um, and so far, there hasn't been any budging on, like, increasing the rates or anything, though. Right. I mean, what I heard today was um, reach back again because it sounded yeah. like they are now paying attention and right. trying to resolve issues about these, to help these children. So I think, you know, if, if this week they're paying attention to it, this is the week to reach out again yeah. and appeal, um, this, you know, put in appeals for this. Um, and then let's see. Oh, one quick last question. Gregory, you were talking about um, the challenges with the communication with DOE. Do you have specific suggestions on how the city could better communicate um, details? Yeah. yeah. I think some of it is, um, it's, they've been doing uh, fall, uh, the, what they're calling fall learning series is from DYCD. I think having more opportunity for open questions. So allowing the providers to um, speak and speak more on these and come back, I think will be helpful. Um, also just getting, um, you know, at least contingency plans in advance. So knowing, for example, the schools may close, um, having some information prior, and I understand we may be hearing about this soon, um, but if you're, you know, knowing that this was a possibility two months ago, um, creating those contingency plans and saying, well, we don't know every single number that will be in here. Here are the basic plans um, that you need to know. Um, and basically also just um, updating uh, via email, like letting folks know when there uh, is new guidance and having as clear guidance as possible. I think like just to reiterate, not reiterate, but to um, highlight um, the early childhood education uh, department through DOE has been sending out bulletins since the beginning of the pandemic. And like, you know, sometimes there's a bunch of new information in there that is really helpful to providers. Um, they send them out a few times a week. And I don't even think like, like Gregory said, I don't even think anything that elaborate has to be sent. I think like just more emails, even just like free, frequently asked question documents, I think would be helpful. A lot of these things have just not been put into writing for providers. Um, so like people are just scrambling at the last minute when things do change, when the school does go remote or when 
if everything goes remote, all the schools go remote, like really what does that mean for the learning labs and our program? So they'll reach out to their program managers individually at DYCD, but it would just be helpful if there was more universal language. This, these are the, this is the game plan. This is what you need to do, um, which is just not, it's lacking right now in, in my opinion. <laughs> So what you're saying, and we receive many of those e-blasts as well with information. For example, we get weekly updates from Department of Social Services, but they're 20 pages long and uh, I hardly read them anymore. And it really would be great if right at the top that it would say for the week of blah, blah, here are the top three thing changes that have been. Yeah. Yeah, I need something like that, Gregory. I think <laughs> yeah, that, absolutely. that sounds People. great. <laughs> this is like, you know, even, and I think again, like DOE, the early childhood bulletins have done uh, a decent job and they even have like a, a place online where you can look at past bulletins um, that has been really helpful, you know. Um, but again, I don't even know if you need anything that elaborate. I think like what you said, council member, just like top three things you need to know this week. Maybe there isn't anything you need to know this week, but like, Usually there is, because <laughs> we're in the middle of a pandemic, so. I would second that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm glad the admin is still on. Um, and then one thing you just, uh, the way you answered this question, Faith, about how if you're a regular provider, the information is in there. What happens for providers who are not, you know, the new contracted provider? providers, do they get any updates since they're not part of the system or do they get an update that is, um, and you might not know the answer to this question, but do they get an update that is specific just for Learning Labs Bridges? Do they get the whole update for early childhood? Do we know? Yeah, I, I'm unsure. I don't know, Gregory, if you know that answer. Yeah, my guess is all of your providers yeah. already have contracts. Yeah, we didn't have any, um, and we had some providers that were, they are not DYC providers and they looked into the program and in the end they just decided like, this is way beyond <laughs> what we can do right now and decided not to go for the RFI when it was introduced. Um, but all of our providers were current DYCD providers. Right, right. I mean, again, it might be worth suggesting to your providers, and I'm going to do this with mine, that they look at it again, because it sounds like it's gotten, you know, improved on over time. And perhaps now there's clearer uh, guidance um, that, and it might be easier. Uh, I'd also like to add that they should be uh, emailing the testing rates, particularly as they come closer to 3%. In other words, you're saying each individual provider should get the information about their own testing rates? But, there, but, but also citywide, since that influences what the citywide decisions are going to be. Got it. Yeah, you could see that being the top thing <laughs> on the regular updates. Yeah. That's City rate is, you know, 2.999. Um, Okay, that is super, super helpful. Again, thank you all for the work that you do. It's extraordinary. Um, thank you. For all my questions. Really appreciate everyone on the panel here. Thank you. Before we go back to Chair Rose, um, if I could just ask if there are any council members who are present who have questions, um, if you can please use the raise hand function in Zoom. We are noting no council member questions. Um, and then before also handing it back to Chair Rose, um, at this point, we have concluded public testimony if there are no other questions. So if we inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, if you can also, if those individuals could please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Uh, I am noting that uh, Ms. Sudan, Felicia Sudan, has raised her hand. Sorry, can everyone hear me? Yes, Ms. Student. So uh, go ahead. Thank you. Ms. Sudin, oh, you're muted again. 
We can hear you. Thank you. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure. Can everyone hear me without the echo? Great. Um, so um, based on today's testimony, I just wanted to give a little bit of remarks because, you know, based on what I'm hearing, you know, Siemens has done a lot of work in the community, you know, serving children, right? Like so when they talked about the disenfranchised children that are being served that are in foster care or in prevention services, those are the families that we've been serving for such, you know, a long time. Our staff, we have licensed clinical social workers, we have, you know, staff who have education, all of our staff actually that would have been working in the program are pets cleared and have a background clearance. And so, you know, that ability to be able to continue to serve, you know, the community is of utmost importance. You know, our healthcare management includes nurses. And so we have these capabilities on staff through the continuum of care that we provide. And for us to not be able to have the opportunity, you know, given the need of the community is just so, you know, unfortunate. Um, and I just want to thank everyone who has given, you know, Siemens Society over the years, the support um, that's needed so that we can continue to do the services that we're doing. Um, I commend every single agency that's on here and every provider because we've kept our doors open to the children every single day in fear for our own lives and have done this safely, right? Like if there's anything that we can say that has gone well is the fact that we've done this successfully with little to minimum exposure, right? And so that just speaks volumes to the dedication that we have to the communities that we serve. And I just think it's only fair that everyone get an opportunity who's invested in the community, be able to do that with the resources and the supports that's needed. And so I just wanted to, you know, add that um, to the testimony because I just think it's so important. You know, how do you fight to like serve your own community? That's like absolutely, you know, insane. But I commend every single person on this call today. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much. I'm gonna return it to Chair Rose. Okay. Um, I, I just want to uh, thank all of the panelists. I want to thank you for the work that you're doing, that um, it's oftentimes very hard, tedious, and, and unappreciated sometimes. I just want you to know that we really appreciate what you're doing. We appreciate that you have challenges that are not of your own doing, that you fight real hard every day to overcome some um, barriers that some artificial, some that are um, have seemed insurmountable, uh, but you 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 keep going on to serve the young people in our communities. So I want to first thank you all. You know, I want to say to Seaman Society, we are going to follow up with DYCD um, to see um, if and how this can be, you know, addressed. And, and to, um, to Gregory and Faith, um, you know, thank you. you you've, you've always risen to the occasion despite all of the obstacles that, you know, that seem to be placed in, in your way. Um, and, and I wanna thank you for, for that, for continuing, you know, the tenacity to, to work with this committee and to work with city administration um, to deliver services. I, I wanna um, thank my co-chair, Helen for Helen Rosenthal for, you know, her wonderful, you know, in-depth, um, hard hitting uh, questioning. Um, I, I wanna thank you for helping us get to the root, nope. No, 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 no. I want to thank you for <laughs> helping us get to the root of, of these issues. And, um, and uh, I know that we're going to be able to work together. It's so important. You know, women are, are really the backbone. Women um, constitute a large number of the workforce. And they're being, you know, disproportionately impacted once again by the lack of you know, their ability to find safe places for their children to be while they work because out of necessity, not because it's something that they just wanna enhance their economic standing. And so um, with that, I wanna thank the administration for, you know, for their diligence in working to, 
to meet the need. Um, the need is great. Um, I, and, you know, my only issue is that we need to expedite it, if, you know, as quickly as possible. Um, no child, no child should be left out there without the necessary services. And especially since we apparently have the ability to deliver those services. So um, I want to thank you all for being here and being a part of this, this uh, committee. And, and this hearing today. And I assure you that there's going to be ample follow-up and that uh, we will make, make the, the whatever answers that we get um, available to all of the participants in this hearing today. Um, with that, um, this year, do, I don't hear, Helen, do you wanna say anything? No, okay. Sure. Chair Rosenthal is shaking her head no for the record. Okay. All right. So with that, this meeting is adjourned at 1.28 um, p.m.